reading an interview with John Bryan, and the one thing that stuck out to me in the interview was he said, just have one good mic and just have that mic always on and just put it on everything. Each room that something might happen in, invest in one really nice mic and just have it on all the time. Probably the one thing that's like resulted in so much good stuff happening for my entire career that I've always remembered that. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. You may already know that using true analog gear is one of the best ways to create a great record. Yet increasingly, we live in a digital world, recording and mixing inside the computer. So what if you could have the best of both worlds? Tegeler Audio Manufacturer is bridging the analog-digital divide by creating high-end analog gear like the Schwerkraft Maschine compressor and the Raumzeit Maschine reverb whose knobs you can control remotely using a plug-in in your DAW. Or their many analog units like the Cream bus compressor with mastering EQ or the VeriTube recording channel that let you save your settings using a custom recall sheet plugin, offering a complete line of pro audio gear from compressors to EQs to reverbs and beyond. Now you can get a pro analog sound while benefiting from the power of digital. Let your DAW help you move your knobs so that your music can move you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about Tegeler Audio Manufactor. Hey, rock stars! it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Steve Dawson, a multi-Juno award-winning musician with over 80 projects into his career, producing award-winning recordings for such artists as Kelly Joe Phelps, Jim Burns, old man, Ludicky. How do you say that one? Luda? That's it. Ludicky? Ludica, uh, technically, Ludica. but All right, everyone cool. pronounces that one wrong. I, I like that. <laughs> man. It sounds like a, a strange fish from Iceland or something, but that's very cool. <laughs> um, the Deep Dark Woods, Big Dave McLean, um, John Hammond, Jenny Whiteley. Steve works on stage and in the studio with musicians as diverse as Tim O'Brien, Matt Chamberlain. Jay Belarus, Wayne Horovitz, Jim Barber, Colin Janes, Colin Linden, Sonny Landreth, and the McCrary sisters. Very cool. Steve's got eight solo albums to his credit and tours as a sideman as well, recently touring regularly with the band Birds of Chicago. Great sounding band. Um, he owns an impressive collection of unusual instruments, many of which he plays on the recordings he helps to craft. Modern electrical instruments find themselves blended in with Weisenborns, or how do you say, Weisenborns? Weisenborn. Weisenborns. Yep. Marxophones, pedal steel, pump organs, and other odd antique instruments. Canadian-born Steve currently resides and works in Nashville, Tennessee, at his own Hen House studio. Um, a big shout out also to Mark Rubel from Blackbird Academy for make, helping us make the connection. In fact, Rockstars, you should know Mark, who's also been a guest on the show, has uh, connected me with many of our guests recently. So thank you, and uh, you're fantastic, Mark. We all yeah, want Mark you to rules. Know that. <laughs> Please welcome Steve Dawson to Recording Studio Rockstars. Steve, are you ready to rock? I am ready to rock. Welcome to the Toy Box, man, and welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. Thanks, man. It's great. Great to be here. I've listened to the show a bunch of times, and it's cool to actually be in the space where it goes down. Well, I'm excited to have you here. A um, couple of things. We noticed it's a beautiful day outside. So, rock stars, if you hear birds chirping and uh, hopefully even the train and maybe a dump truck will go by or something <laughs> like that, that's because we're leaving the door wide open. It's just too beautiful. It's, you not, know, it's not your new special effects CD. And I, I know. It's like, you know, when you do podcasts and, and you create your own content online, you have to occasionally remind yourself that you're your own boss and you can do whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. And if leaving the door wide open during a podcast interview is what you want to do on a beautiful day, just do it. Damn straight. So um, I apologize, Steve. I, I also didn't mention yet, you also have a wonderful podcast. 
Maybe you can begin by introducing us to your own podcast and what that's all about. Sure. I have a podcast called Music Makers and Soul Shakers. And the idea with it was to um, basically talk to musicians, some artists that are like well-known, but more like behind the scenes kind of guys about uh, their playing and their history, but from kind of a nerdy musician perspective. So we get into like pretty specific stuff. I really wanted to know, like, I think the thing that kind of like made me want to do it was listening to like Mark Maron's podcast where he interviews musicians, but it never felt like it went deep enough into the process for me. But he got amazing guests and and was really, you know, he would put on interesting shows with those people. But I always wanted to go deeper. Do you, do you start every episode with with like the first question is just like Stratocaster or Les Paul? <laughs> well, I kind of go I go with like all different instruments too, right? So like there's keyboard players and Charlie McCoy was in a few weeks ago, so he's a harmonica player and uh, drummers. I've had some great drummers on the show and. Uh, you know, I, I'm a guitar player and steel player, so that when when there's a guitar player or a steel player, then it gets super nerdy. Oh, yeah. But when it's like a drummer, I'm still coming at it from a musical perspective, just not like a total drum nerd perspective. Um, so, and you play a little bit of everything. You also play drums too, or not? I play a little bit of everything, but guitar and stringed instruments yeah. are my thing. Uh, maybe we can talk about that for a sec. For me, I came into this as a guitar player. Uh, my mom gave me as a graduation present from architecture school she gave me a banjo Ooh. thank you mom M maybe <laughs> it wasn't the best tactical decision because it did redirect my entire life and career but I i'm glad for it for sure um and then but it wasn't until i got into the studio stuff and i actually made my own studio that all of a sudden i'm like i want to have a drum set i want to mm -hmm. have some keyboards i want to start like playing all these different instruments and i feel like that's one of the really fun things about getting into recording and creating your own studios, it really tempts you to want to learn. Like, you don't have to be great at them, but just to play them a little bit and understand them better is really fun totally. to do. Yeah. I found that as well. Basically the same thing. Like, I was pretty much just obsessed with guitar all through my young life. And then when I started getting uh, studio equipment and kind of gearing myself up to be able to record, then, yeah, exactly the same. Like, I wanted a drum kit. But my taste was always, like, weird – like I sort of erring towards the old junky broken down kind of versions of things. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like I have a fifties radio King drum set. That's really nice. It's a great kit, but it's like, not everyone can really big drum, big kick drum, 26 inch. Yeah. yeah. It's big. Uh, and I've got calfskin heads on it. So some drummers come in and they're just like, I, I don't know what to do with this thing. You know, you, if you hit it hard, it sounds like shit, but if you play it right, it's amazing. This guy, Jamie Dick, was in the other day. He's a fantastic drummer, um, plays with Rhiannon Giddens uh, a lot, and he he loved my kit. And he was actually the first drummer <laughs> that's ever come into my studio and, like, really loved my kit. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then, like, for, you know, for basses and, like, all the other instruments that aren't my main thing, I kind of have weird old junky ones. Yeah. You know? That's sort of what I like. You know, let's, let, let me ask a question that popped into my head about drums. So, um to the extent that you feel comfortable answering it, let's talk about different drum sizes. Cause those are the things mm -hmm. that, you know, when you have a drum kit around the studio or you need to get something, you know, all of a sudden you're like, well, I don't know how big a snare drum is. It's just a snare drum, right? Yeah. So you want to talk for just a sec about and like 26 inches for a kick drum is a really big kick drum. A normal one, the one most common would be about 22, right? That we would say. I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I'm not, you know, I'm no drum expert, but, Dang it, uh, but I asked you the wrong question, <laughs> but I would say 22, 24 seems to be a big one that would yeah. come in. Yeah. And I like anyone and that brings 20 their own is like the cool jazz, yeah. the small jazz kit. Yeah. Sounds, and you right? can make those sound huge. Like it's not yeah. really relative to the sound, to the, to the, to the sound, right. You, you can mask that and obviously make a, a uh, twenty-inch kick sound massive if you do it right. Yeah, and a K every once in a blue moon, you might get somebody who's like turned a floor tom on its side, and they're like, "That's my kick drum." Yeah, yeah, we, I've done that on a bunch of records. Actually, that's a really good technique for if you're doing like a really quiet record. That works really well because you don't have to rein anything in too much. So I've done a couple records recently where, where nobody's wearing headphones and everyone's playing live, and uh, and in one actually a couple of those, the drummer played uh, a flipped over. Uh, floor tom and it was great nice and, and the, then of and course the opposite the, uh, of that was I, I worked with a guy named Stephen hodges who's mavis staples drummer and oh, tom cool. waits's drummer and he brought in a 36 inch kick drum 
<laughs> so it, that made mine look like a floor tom. <laughs> That's like one of those giant, um, like when my daughter's in school band and they have yeah. a huge bass drum and it's sort of angled at 45 degrees. Yeah, exactly. I don't know how big those are, but they're they're big. Um, okay, so then let's see, let's quickly go around some of the other ones. I think a snare typically is 14 inches yeah. for the head, right? Yeah, that's right. And then the toms might be like 12. Mine are 12 and 16. 12 and oh, 16 is the floor tom? Yeah. Right. All right. Great. That's good insight. And then, so an 18 inch floor tom would be like a really big floor tom. Yeah, I guess I've, I don't think I've ever even seen an 18, but I, so maybe I, I would imagine 16, that maybe that's it. Maybe that's like the, that's as big as they go. All right, maybe. cool. See, I think that's really, these are good insights because yeah. we'll, you know, when we're doing we're sessions and we don't know that already. Just remember rock stars, 22, 14, 12, 16. Yeah. Oh, let's write that down somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, Tell us, in your own words, who you are and where you come from. How'd you get into this recording stuff? Well, um, I am from Vancouver, Canada, originally. Uh, I spent most of my career there up until uh, five years ago. And Vancouver is uh, it's it's just, just for gen Geology 101. General Geography. It's two hours I mean, north ge of Seattle. Geography, not geology, right? Well, no, give us the geology, too. <laughs> I, that, I, I can't do that. Lane uh, Forest. It is a rainforest. It rains constantly, um, but, but it's two hours due north of Seattle. So that's where it is. It's basically right on the American border. Yeah, west and coast of the U.S. and, and it's up coast. in Canada. And it's also a place where near the water. And, and uh, yeah. don't you have islands off of Vancouver? Yeah, there's like Vancouver Island, and then there's what's called the Gulf Islands, which are a, a series of 30, 40. Well, actually, there's thousands of them, but major ones. There's about 12, I guess. Nice. And it's all ferries and... and yeah, you play gigs over there. Fairies a lot. the kind with wings? No, fairies <laughs> the kind that get stuck in the water a lot, and you sit there waiting for them and paying way too much money to get on them. Oh wow! Those All kind. right, um, and then I guess one <laughs> other detail about Vancouver that I'm aware of, and I'm no expert, but um, it's also kind of a, a film industry town, right? And then there yeah. there is a real history of music and recording there is. studios and stuff there. Yeah, which I actually got to see secondhand. So when I was so, yeah, so I grew up in Vancouver and started playing in bands there and in high school. And then I went to Berkeley College of Music right nice. after high school. And then I came back to Vancouver. And I, I stayed in Vancouver all through my music days. And that's where I started playing in bands that got into studios. And, and that's where I got interested in, in the process. Pretty quickly, I was pretty interested in it. I didn't take, like, I went to Berkeley, but I was strictly doing performance there. So just guitar yeah. performance. How did you enjoy Boston? I liked it. It freaked me out. You know, I was like 18. I just said Boston, Boston somehow. I don't know how that came out like that. but <laughs> It was, you know, like I'd never really lived anywhere other than my parents' house. And then I moved to Boston and it was pretty crazy. Yeah. And uh, I, I loved Berkeley, though, because it wasn't what I expected. What I thought I was going to do was become a jazz guitarist. That's all I was interested in. But really quickly after I got there, I got really interested in bluegrass and country music and Western swing and all this other stuff. Cause that was all going on there. Um, like Gillian Welch and Dave Rawlings were there at the same time. And, oh, um, yeah. uh, a bunch of people that start, like, I think now like string band music is a huge part of what goes on at Berkeley. Like there's a whole section for it, but back then that wasn't happening yet, but did there you, was songwriting and there was a little bit going on. I, I took a bunch did of, did you take the songwriting class? I took one, yeah. With Pat, Pat Patterson. Patterson. Yeah. yeah, I was reading his book and he quotes Gillian in the book. Right. Yeah. So and he I went with them on a trip to Nashville in like ninety two or something. That was you know, and then and then Gillian and Dave moved down here the same time I left. So ninety three or ninety four. But you're only like twenty seven years old now, right? <laughs> I am not twenty seven. You look young, man. You look like well, music is uh, life and music is treating you well. <laughs> um Cool. Well, you know, I, one of the things I enjoyed about reading um, some of the Pat Patterson book, I haven't read the, gotten through the whole thing, but it, it was very eye-opening to me about the process of writing. Mm -hmm. um, lyric writing is a real challenge for me right now. That's mm -hmm. sort of a, my next um, big adventure. Right. And um, I thought there were some cool insights in there. Do you do a lot of uh, songwriting yourself as well? Yeah, it goes in phases. Like I'll, I'll put out records and I'll write songs and I'll go through phases of being fairly prolific in that department. And then if I'm producing a lot and working in the studio a lot, that kind of takes a backseat. Yeah. And then lately I've been writing more instrumental stuff. So I have a new record coming out 
uh, in a few weeks. It's all instrumental. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always working on music, but not necessarily lyrics. I don't do the co-writing thing really at all. It doesn't, I'm not really comfortable doing that. Yeah. I do co-write with production, with people I'm producing sometimes. Well, if you're busy making records for other people that, you know, sort of ready to go, then... Yeah, that's how I feel. I mean, I I feel if they need help with with song writing, they're not really ready to make a record yet. And so I usually encourage them to go off and write some more songs. Okay, so you're in Vancouver hitting studios there, and then you made your way down to Nashville. Yeah, well, I mean, I spent my entire career. Like, I've spent 25 years basically working as a professional musician and producer and engineer in Vancouver. You know, I got my own experiences playing in bands and and working on things. But there were some interesting opportunities there. And one of them was the fact that you mentioned that Vancouver was a bit of a hotspot in the 80s and 90s. So what happened there was there was guys like Bob Rock was from Vancouver, um, Bruce Fairburn, all these guys. Brian Adams, right? Yeah. he have a studio up there? Yeah, he still does. I I work there all the time. It's called The Warehouse. Um, But anyway, Bruce Fairburn is the guy that produced... Uh, Slippery When Wet for Bon Jovi, which oh, nice. is like the second biggest selling record of all time or some wow. outrageous fact. So he he went, for, like he was in a band called Prism that was like a Canadian rock band in the 70s. Then he started producing this band called Honeymoon Suite, which was like a kind of like a hard rock band in the 80s. They were kind of big in Canada. And then Bon Jovi, I think, was about to get dropped by their label after their first record that stiffed. And they paid Bruce some paltry sum to produce a record for them. And that was Slippery One Wet? Yeah, and he and he took point, like a lot of points on that record and made so much money, you can't even imagine. Like, wow. I, I, don't, I don't know the facts, but I've heard some rumors about it. Anyway, so this whole thing sprung up around Vancouver based around Bruce and Bob Rock and all these guys that were doing hard rock stuff. So all the uh, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, Motley Crue, Scorpions, all, the, all that in, stuff was being Vancouver, done really? in Vancouver, which had nothing to do with me. I was a kid, but when I got back from Berkeley in 93, Bruce Fairburn called me out of the blue and said, I'm Bruce Fairburn. Uh, I have a couple kids. Do you want to teach them guitar? Uh, Oh, cool. Yeah. So I was like, "Uh, yeah, sure. I'll (laughs) you bet. So I went over to his house and and he had two sons, uh, Scott and Brent, and I taught them guitar for years and uh, like probably three or four years, I guess, like not constantly, but on and off. And... Bruce would always take time with me to like just kind of shoot the shit and talk about recording. And he was a brilliant, brilliant musician uh, and and producer. And he would invite me down. So I got to see Motley Crue and the Scorpions and Kiss and all this stuff was happening in Vancouver. In the studio? Or just in the going studio. To, yeah, that's wild. Yeah, he would invite me in basically to be a fly Is on the Is there wall. something about the location that lends itself well to hard rock? I have no idea what that's what that was all about. It's gone. That 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 Came industry away. doesn't exist. Like around '95, it just evaporated. Like the taste, of course, like musical styles changed. That kind of music was no longer in favor. And Bruce died around then, and Bob Rock moved away, and you know all, all these things happened, and Vancouver just ceased to be like a hot spot for recording. Wow! But I did get to see it through that through through Bruce's little scene, which was fascinating to me. Um, and I kind of thought that's how you make made records, which yeah. kind of informed me in a really weird way for a while because it's so opposite from the way that I work now. I, I think it was actually helpful for me to see it being done so far in the extreme. Like literally they were overdubbing the every string for every chord of the guitar. Wow. Just to get perfect tuning, yeah. precision, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That was the, I remember watching the Scorpions and I remember like just sitting there going like, holy shit, like how can you not go bananas doing this for like nine hours? <laughs> and so he would, they would like, I remember watching him play like the the E string of a G power chord only, just the one note for the chorus of one song. And then they'd go back and then they'd double that note and then they'd go back and triple that note. And then they'd go back and then they'd do the D note of the G power chord in the sense. So, you know, you build up hundreds and hundreds of tracks and then the engineers would, from what I understand, it was Mike Plotnikoff, who was a friend of mine, was engineering a bunch of that stuff. And he would go in and basically sit there all night. So Bruce would leave around at seven or eight at night and Mike would sit there from 8 p.m. until 8 a.m. editing all this shit. into. (laughs) You know, I feel like that is yet another example of how 
so much of music and musical expression and like the next sound in music is about taking the latest technology, technological capability, and just pushing it right up to the limit. So, you know, I, I think that's I mentioned exactly this before, right. But yeah. like, you know, the 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 idea of auto tune, yeah, it gets pushed to the limit, and then it becomes a thing. And you know, right. maybe at some point, it's not we're not done with auto tune yet, but at some point, maybe we're <laughs> done with it. But we're like, done with uh, it at my studio. <laughs> but like, you know, that that kind of layering had to have been a result of the ability to have multiple, like synced up twenty four tracks, totally. locked yep. together, where you can. <clears throat> yep fill up 23 tracks of one tape machine and then bounce, bounce them down to one yeah. track of another tape machine, all that kind of That's stuff. That's exactly what they were doing. Yeah. And that was pre, I mean, the only digital that was around at that time was ADATs and they weren't using it because they were super fidelity buffs too, right? Like they worked, the The guy that was the tech there is one of the most genius techs ever. He just died a few years ago. His name's John Furtasek. And he designed all these great studios for people. And he designed a bunch of gear and speakers and DI boxes that were super advanced. And uh, he was always around. And they were all like really obsessed with the highest quality. So even, even ping-ponging 23 to 1 would have really irritated them that they would have had to do it. But there was no digital option. Yeah. Them. But that was the sound, right? Like that was the sound of those records. That's yeah. how they got it. Yeah. There was no other way to get it. You can't you can't just put Joe Perry in a room and have him play a power chord and have it sound like Aerosmith pump. They're gonna go in and do it the way that Bruce did it. And that was his way of doing it. It was so interesting. He, to was see. Aerosmith pump one of his as well? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So and I imagine when I think of that kind of sound, that layered sound, mm -hmm. I think of um a quality of hugeness, but not um, not necessarily detail, right? It's like you can't hear the individual voices in a choir, a chorus, right? But it's a Honestly, huge like, sound altogether. I found it so fascinating, but I didn't listen to that kind of music, so it wasn't like I wasn't listening to Aerosmith Pump. So I, yeah. it, it, I didn't I didn't make the connection between all that I saw going on there and then like really devouring it as a fan because it just wasn't the kind of thing that I was into. Like I was into like. Jimmy Reed and stuff like that. And yeah. those kind of like really rough records from the fifties and sixties. And then there was this going on. I was like, what the hell is this? It's so crazy that you're making music this way. And then I was like, is that how Jimmy Reed made a record in 1953? Like, was he overdubbing his chords one at a time? <laughs> and so it took me a while to kind of process that all. I was young, right? Like I didn't know. I thought, I just thought that's how you made a record. So I had to kind of like, see that in action to really believe it and then like figure out my own way of doing things. Yeah. Eventually. Well, so let's fast forward a little bit. So um, what did you, what are some things that you adopted as your own way? You know, what were some takeaways from all that? And did, you know, did you just discard all that overproduction or do you feel like that gave you skills and knowledge that are useful to you in much simpler records somehow? It gave me skill and knowledge in patience, I think, like being able to watch them sit there and not get frustrated by that process is is monumental. Uh, and so, you know, something like that. Also, like, his musicality was unbelievably high. And, like, you know, if, if that one note that the guy was playing was, like, a microtone sharp, Bruce would, he'd call it right, right yeah. away. And, you know, like, seeing finely tuned precision like that was interesting to me. And I've kind of retain some of that for sure. Let me ask you this question, because I go through that myself too. My ear has become trained to um, hear tuning that I never heard when I started. You mm -hmm. know, I, I'm aware of stuff in a completely different way. But also the process of going through that, sometimes, you know, I can I can be calling bullshit on guitar tunings mm -hmm. only to go back later and listen to the different ones and and like be slightly in doubt of whether or not I was actually hearing a problem that was really a problem or not. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself um, going through that? Do you ever find that you're aware of all these details? Like you're in the trenches, <laughs> and then when you just zoom out a little bit, you're like, man, I don't know. I what, play the pedal steel, man. So it's like all about, like, you can get so obsessed with micro, micro, micro tuning. You know, like with pedal steel, you're talking about a very variant of a tuning by one or one and a half cents. There's no way a, yeah. a person can hear that. But if you're a pedal steel player, you can hear it because it drives you bananas after, you know, like if you're trying to tune the thing 
there's all these ways to tune a pedal steel, right? And you have to kind of find what works for you. But it's all about these, you know, microtones, all these notes in between other notes. And on the pedal steel, it's because you have to compensate for the instrument naturally going out of tune. You have to basically, yeah. you're just finding a the least shitty sounding way to tune the instrument to make it actually work. And so, yeah, I mean, you focus in on that, you zone in, and then when you zone out and you listen to the whole thing as a whole, all that stuff just vanishes. Yeah. But it, it's hard. You can't do that right away. Yeah, it takes you know? a minute. You can't, I've learned that about making records. You can't be both zoomed in and zoomed out it's at impossible. the same time. Yeah, yeah. It takes a while. For me, it takes a couple of years. You know, like I don't go back. I'm, I'm not sitting around listening to records I make. Like I don't do that. I, I guess, I don't know if some people do that or whatever, but I don't do that myself. But if I do hear something like five years later, it comes on the radio or somebody's playing it at a club, I'm usually like, hey, that's pretty, like, well, that was good. We did a good thing there. Whereas at the time, I was probably ripping my hair out about, yeah, you know, yourself up and everything. the bass tone or something. And, like, of course, that just vanishes eventually. Yeah. Um, that is in part of the title for this is uh, Loving the Mistakes. Capturing the moment, loving the mistakes, and embracing the bleed. And mistakes is an interesting thing about making records. I remember, you know, with my own band, some of the first recordings we did, just being so like it painfully aware of mistakes yeah. in a performance only to get away from it and come back later. I actually left my band and then came back. And then when I'm listening to our record with the band, the rest of the guys are like, Oh my God, that's the best that thing you did right there. This that's is my favorite part. part of that song. Yeah. You know, of course for me, it's like, you know, thinking it's a double <laughs> chorus and being like, there we are. Oh, sorry. Guys. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, I think that, um, I think that's important stuff. What, what, what comments do you want to make about the mistakes in music and, and, uh, well, I guess, that's important. I guess that, you know, like from the extreme that we were just talking about of like perfectionism, everything's mapped out to the point where there's no such thing as a mistake because everything's done to a grid and perfectly in tune and perfectly in time and tripled to the point where you can't hear anything other than exactly what you're intending to hear. So, you know, that's how I, that's how I started. I wasn't involved in that process, but I watched it. And then as I evolved and my taste and my skills evolved, I just kind of like went in the opposite direction. And now what I really cherish about recording is seeing or just being around and, and being a part of these things that happen that are totally unplanned and that 10 minutes prior to it happening, there's no way that you could have ever dreamed up such yeah. a thing to happen. Yeah, and all you can do is kind of be ready yeah. So that when that moment happens, you captured it. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of that comes too from like getting to know musicians and how they work and who's really good and who would work well together and what sounds you're going for and what sounds are coming at you in the room at the moment. And then because you can't plan for stuff like you can, but it's cooler, I think, if you don't, because all kinds of crazy shit happens, you yeah. know, like even I remember like when I first was producing records. So I've been producing records for, I guess, 20 years now. So when I first started, I would, I would like write the bass lines out for the bass player. And I would, I wouldn't write the drum parts out because drummers generally couldn't read them, but I would know exactly what I wanted them to play. And I would show them. There's no way I would like, do that boom, now. Boom chick, boom boom chick. <laughs> Not boom boom chick, boom chick. There's no way I would do that now. Like I, I but I but I'm careful about who I put in a room. But I would not dream of telling a drummer what to play unless I think it's like going way off the rails and we need to like really start again or if it's like the approach is wrong or the volume's wrong or so, whatever. If it needs guidance, I'll guide it. But but I don't get involved in the, in that kind of stuff anymore. I I just trust that people are good at what they do. Yeah, and, because you've chosen the right people to play yeah. together, especially if you have that opportunity to actually. And people are help. way better if they're not being told what to do. Too. Right, like right. they're way more into it, and they're they're more locked in, and you know that kind of stuff evolves naturally. Well, let's talk about that same experience or that same comment from your perspective. When you're playing on somebody's thing, how do you feel about? somebody giving you guidance or over guiding you versus when you just do your own thing? I don't really care. Like as a musician, like if I go into a session here in Nashville playing pedal steel or guitar or something and somebody gets really picky and specific about it, 
I don't, I, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. I, you know, in the back of my mind, I'll probably be thinking, well, I think it was better when I did the first take. My first <laughs> idea was better. <laughs> but I would never say that. And I'll sit there and do it 50 times if they want me to. It's your, not going to get Your idea is literally just making me 15 minutes to late to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I don't personally mind because I'm kind of used to that too. Like being in, in a session, like the all, it's all different. Like I'll go in and do sessions and we do one take and it's over and done and you never hear it again. Um, but if, if there's a producer, sometimes the producer wants to overdo it. I find maybe to impress a client or something that happens occasionally. That's and you just kind of have to ride that out because yeah. that gets frustrating <laughs> for everybody. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's really not a good situation to be in. But more often than not, that doesn't happen. I've certainly experienced a variety of those situations. I've experienced stuff where I'm not really saying anything and brilliant stuff's coming out of the speakers. I've I've experienced stuff where I get excited about what could what where we could go with this yep. and so I try and communicate it and ha- and I've certainly completely overdone it and completely screwed up somebody's ability to perform anything at all by just like telling them way too much and yeah know. I yeah. remember our guitar player in our band with an ADAT no less you know I'd be like you played right there you went dun, 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 on the guitar <laughs> and if you just kind of go like ding 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 right after that and I'm just gonna rewind and punch you in ready set go and he's just like he what? just had no idea what was going <laughs> on. You know? Meanwhile, I think I'm being a ninja on the ADAT, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's part of it, too. I think um, initially, it is. we get excited about um, what we think we can do well. And it's yeah. a good learning lesson to like get past that and just be like, it's, it's not about me right now. Yeah. And I've I've been around enough like live tracking situations where you go back and listen to the first take and it just sounds so fucking good, you yeah. know, or the second take maybe. Or... Even with the mistakes, yeah. there's like a fresh quality. Yeah. Sometimes you, you can't always n- really be aware of that until you hear it in comparison. Like you hear the- Totally, or, the, or the, in context, yeah, or in roughly context. in context. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I'm playing on something and producing it- Here comes it. that dump truck, by the way. Oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right, rock stars, enjoy. Um, all right, so over the, over the loudness it's of the dump It's coming to get truck, us. Here comes next question. Um, one of the records uh, th- that you've done with the band Birds of Chicago, American mm-hmm. Flowers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just got a beautiful, pure sound to it. Uh, very full acoustic re- recording. I feel like I noticed that consistently across the records that you sent me. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk about capturing tune and uh, tone and tuning so well on acoustic sessions where people are, I think if I was to describe what I heard, it was, it's, you know, a couple of, or a few people finger picking together, Mm -hmm. harmonies happening maybe at the same time. Um, Just talk about capturing that kind of vibe where you've got people playing together and they really sound, there's a beautiful thing that they do together. How do you want to capture that? You know, is it like, do you use headphones even? Uh, In that case, no, we didn't use headphones. We, um, that was... Uh, so the Birds of Chicago is basically two people. It's a guy named JT and a woman named Allison Russell, who I originally knew from Vancouver. They live here now, and they so it's the two of them, and then there's a band. There's a guitar player, which is sometimes me, and there's a bass player, and there's a drummer. And for that record, we also had a singer uh, in who sings with them sometimes, uh, and we had Kenneth Pattengale in from the Milk Carton Kids, and we had... Um, a couple other guests drop in who I can't remember right now. But uh, basically, um, JT is playing acoustic guitar, sometimes finger-picked, sometimes strummed. Um, and my approach with that kind of thing is just very basic. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I may have to shut the door here. <laughs> All right, rock stars. Momentary pause, about to close the door pause for the for dunk the truck. So the setup in that was that was in my studio, which is not a huge room, um, but we set up really close. I was playing pedal steel sometimes, or electric guitar, or or like national um, steel body guitar. Kenneth from the Milk Carton Kids was playing acoustic guitar. Um, everyone was singing live, and I think that there's a lot to be said for capturing um, harmony vocals live. 
in that context. You couldn't get the rest of the dead milkmen to join your session. <laughs> Sorry, I was just trying to remember those guys. Uh, so there's no overdubs on that record. Um, they they didn't even want to listen back. Um, we just did like three takes. I was sort of co-producing it with JT. Um, you know, we would go by feel We've when we felt like we had it. Uh, you know, it, it was basically, we were ready to go. We didn't, and we didn't add anything to it. That's an unusual situation for me. In general, I do add things. I do manipulate sounds. On that record, I didn't touch anything. So, you know, there's certain tricks that I have to, you know, like a, a guy playing a fingerpick guitar and singing, where his fingerpick guitar is way quieter than his vocal is. There's, there's tricks that you can do to kind of like, accentuate that and make it sound not distant. Yeah, let's talk about um, that because that's one of the big challenges I find that you can run into when you're doing voice and guitar at the same time mm -hmm. is um or or any pair of instruments is that if they're similar volumes then they don't really have there's not they don't create a problem by bleeding on the other mic. Right. But it but when one's quiet, you know, you have to turn up that mic and stuff and then Yeah, and things get start getting phasy and unnatural sounding too if suddenly a finger pick guitar is like as in your face as somebody who's got a powerful voice. But you do want to be able to hear it and you want to have some presence to that thing. So what I basically do is I find, so I always record in mono acoustic instruments. Um, that's like partly from experience, I guess. And part, like I worked with this guy, Kelly Joe Phelps, who for me was like one of the, or is, he's still alive. He just doesn't play anymore, but he's like one of the greatest musicians I've ever played with for uh he was a great he is a great singer uh an unbelievable guitar player but very like imaginative and improvisational like he would never play the same thing twice and we'd made a record with him and tried to mic his guitar in stereo but he was moving and it was just a nightmare uh if somebody's going to be super still then a stereo recording of an acoustic guitar works but for me it just does. I don't like it. I, I don't like the things that happen when people move. And if I'm telling somebody to not move, I'm impeding on their vibe. So yeah. I tend to just use a mono mic. So I, uh, for a record like that, I would have probably used um, something like an Ear Trumpet Lab, um, the Edwina, which I've been using a lot lately. Maybe um, that's the one I wanted to ask you about. I'm, I was looking for my note here, but there was, um, yeah, I think it was American Flowers, and it was like a video of you guys in the living room. Oh, yeah, yeah. You had a couple of cool-looking suspended mics. Yeah. Um, those side. are your Trumpet Labs ones, I think. Um, and those are cool because they're super directional. It's almost like a 57, but it's a condenser. So it's very detailed. Um, they're great for live, but I find them also in the studio. They're really useful. Plus, they have a pivoting... Um, head basically so you can they're really you know it's not like a 57 where you have to aim the mic stand in a certain way to get it aiming you can aim the mic but then you can also move swivel the head in That's all these cool. different directions and it just looks cool it looks like something and out it looks of an old cool. movie you know yeah yeah so that whole steampunk thing is cool and makes yeah, exactly. the musicians go hey that's cool and everyone's high-fiving uh but the great thing about it is you can get it nice and close um and pivot it and so what i tend to do is i'll put the vocal mic of a singer playing a finger-picked guitar, I'll put the vocal mic and the acoustic guitar mic almost in the same spot with the guitar mic. So kind of like in the middle, basically, of like pointed Halfway at their between, chest. It's not quite of. at voice levels, yeah. but it's not quite at guitar And level. then I'll angle the guitar one down and I'll angle the vocal one up. And often I'll put something in between, like maybe a foam little divider thing. If... But sometimes that gets in people's way and makes them feel weird, so I won't do it then. But usually I like to stick something in there. Um, one of those reflection filters, like SE makes those little guys that are like six inches wide or whatever, and they fit perfectly over a mic. Uh, so I kind of like drape one of those over the acoustic one, and then I'll just leave the vocal one as it is. That kind of stuff kind of freaks people out at first. Like they think there's no way that that's going to work. And then, you know, the rejection of, you know, say like I've got a nice M49, a vintage 40, Neumann M49 vocal mic. And I don't know, like that thing shouldn't be rejecting a lot of sound, but it's like, it's amazingly directional for what it is. So if, I, if I've if i got that at the guy's chest aiming up at his mouth, 
it's like 90% vocal and just a whisper of the guitar to the point where there's not really phasing issues. And you can always fix phasing issues if there are some yeah. there. But, you know, if you're careful at the time. Now, you went to school with Dave Rollins, um, mm-hmm. and I know he is also very, very into and particular about microphones and placement and recording acoustic and vocals. Is yeah. that, have you guys worked together? Do you guys have like a private chat group where you just really geek out <laughs> on this stuff? No. Or is it just somebody you knew in school? He's somebody I knew in school and I've seen him a few times since I've been here. He was really nice, actually. I don't know how he heard, but he heard I moved here and phoned me out of the blue and he's like, hey, I'd like to say hi and take you out for dinner. So we, you know, that was kind of nice. I hadn't talked to him for years. Nice. Um, we had a jam session once many, many years ago when I was interning or when I was like first working in a studio. Yeah. And it, and I was playing the drums and he was like, any point I was like, no, no, man, do a rock and roll kick drum on the quarter note. And I was like, really? I didn't know anything about <laughs> kick drums on the quarter notes. Okay, let me try it. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's pretty specific. He's super nerdy too. Like we went into Woodland. He showed me around the studio there and that's that studio is incredible. Yeah, like that's actually where I interned at. Oh, really? Before, okay. Before, before it, it shut David down. Gillian's oh, okay, studio, cool. Yeah. It's incredible. It's huge, and and they basically just have like a little corner where there's like their setup, and there's like little plastic bags over the mics, and I think like they just It's ready to go. See, that's a cool way to do studios to too. I mean, yeah, I've had um, a variety of guests on the show. I think it was John Fields when he was on was talking about. Um, having a studio that's where where everything's mic'd up, you know. I've yeah. always operated my studio in terms of like a it goes back to ground zero in between sessions, zero it out, set it up so right. it's like a custom build for right. the session, which has advantages of whatever your band is and your needs are. We're going to do that, but it has the disadvantage of yeah. it's good. I need the time to set it up before. Totally. Then. Yeah, but um, but I think it's cool to have some stuff where you just walk in. Oh, Turn it on, cool. start yeah. playing your instrument. The interesting thing about those guys too is like they're total gear fanatics. Like they've got like three or four full size marimbas in there. Dave has a crazy collection of tweed Fender tweed amps, but like they never use them on their records. So I don't, I don't even exactly know what they are into all that stuff for. I think they're just kind of like gear fiends because it's fun. Which is awesome. Why else would we do all this music? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so you know, like. Um, I don't know where we were leading with that, but but the um, anyway with with the acoustic thing, I just find like keeping things as simple as possible, especially in a live situation where there's a number of people. Knowing a little bit about um, you know polar patterns and rejection of certain microphones really helps, obviously. Um, yeah, and um, you know some separation I, I like, but for in in a case like that record the american flowers record by birds of chicago there's no headphones so everyone had to be like close like yeah. with, like where you and i are like six feet away at the most yeah. in order to hear things what properly. are some of the benefits of no headphones oh it's unbelievable it's such a great experience um it's it it dictates the way that you play in so many ways as a musician because if you can't hear the bass it's because you're playing too loud that's all that's the only reason so you have to like play quieter and so then that dictates how the attack of your pick sounds on the strings yeah you know what the engineer um, does rock stars when you play quieter they turn the mic pre up <laughs> you know what happens if you got a good mic and a good mic pre it sounds really good yeah in fact that was a t-bone burnett um comment on recording music at one point i remember reading him talk about it. maybe it was in tape op magazine I remember said, that as well. Yeah, it was like the the best way to record is to get everybody to play as quietly as possible and just turn the mics up, make them as hot as you can go. Totally. Yeah, work those preamps super hard and just play like a little quieter. And like that's where you get the tone from drums is when you're hitting them a little quieter. The tone, you know, as soon as you start bashing a kit in a in a in the way that a lot of people seem to approach it these days, I find the tone just kind of like gets sucked into the room really quickly. But you hit those things lightly or, you know, I've been working with Jay Belleros a number of times who plays on all that T-bone stuff and he'll be hitting the snare drum with his finger and he'll be hitting the bass drum with his finger and playing shakers and weird stuff all over the place. And that stuff sounds good, you know, and like hitting the rim of the bass drum with your finger, you'd think would be not a, not not a thing. Not you, a sound. You think it wouldn't work in the context of a drum kit, but it does if you're playing the rest of the drum kit at a certain level. Oh, that's cool. 
Um, now, I'm not sure how this stuff applies to Nirvana and Dave Grohl and you know, <laughs> you know Bon Jovi records and stuff, but uh, maybe it does. Maybe it all it all applies in the in the right kind of ways. Yeah, but I, I, I think it's definitely a great way to go for for. For the um, kind of stuff that I'm talking about, yeah, you know, exactly. which is like rootsy stuff or yeah, yeah, blues totally. or, or you know, any anything in the Americana world, a, somebody like an approach like that is going to work yeah. a lot better. A lot of soul stuff, I think, too. Um, totally, get, you know, having that dynamic and you know, tasteful, quiet to loud playing, which is another. Yeah, if you listen to dynamic. Al Jackson playing, like any of that old soul stuff, Booker T and the MGs, like those guys are playing quietly. Yeah, and he's not smashing on the snare drum to get that wicked sound, or like listen to an Al Green record. Those are all done, from what I understand, most of those are done without headphones in in a room where if the drummer is playing too loud, you're not going to hear the singer, and if you can't hear the singer, you need to play quieter. That's all there was to it. That's a tricky thing. I've done a session, a jazz session here, where we did everybody in live room, no mm -hmm. headphones, and it was. Drums, piano, trumpet, sax, upright bass, um, and vocals even. Yeah. Um, there was one song with the full band that had the vocals and, and the, another one that was um, had vocals and, you know, maybe like some quieter stuff in there. But still, it's it, it's one of my favorite signing records right now. And it right. really sounds, uh, it, it's amazing how well it came together. It's scary yeah. as crap to go into it like that. Totally. And convince everybody to do it. And That's go, the thing is you like, know, you, have like to, you have to like... The person you're doing it for has to totally buy into that concept and want to do it, yeah. right? So I've done a few records like that where it's like that's the approach and people are into it. The, when when I first did it was like four years ago and that Bob Dylan record had come out where he does all the Sinatra tunes. And whatever you think about that record, it sounds amazing. And that was done all with no headphones on and it was really inspiring to know that people were able to pull that off and have it sound like a big lush record and that's when i first made a record for an artist named matt pattershuck from canada and we just were like we're gonna have drums we're gonna have bass it's gonna be a full band but we're not gonna anyone no one's allowed to wear headphones it wasn't like a voluntary thing it was like a forced this is the this is the concept nice you have to buy into it now the reverse of that that i've seen in for example in my bonnaroo studio um is uh, where a band will come in and we've got an hour and it's like, I, I sound check in 10 minutes and it's like, all right, what's the first song? And we go. Is that um, sometimes when you do a no headphones thing, uh, and you, maybe we can talk about this, maybe this comes down to mic choice, but if you've got mics that are sort of designed for a headphone session, then you go no headphones with it people may not get their tone right, their vocal tone right on the vocal mic and yeah. things like that. So yeah. maybe talk about the difference in in approach to recording a no headphone session. Are there some things that where you're like, oh, well, I wouldn't use that same thing I would have used if we were doing a headphone session? Yeah, there's some gear choices for sure. But in general, like as far as like how people approach or like the tone of like a singer, for example, I find the singers overwhelmingly in those situations are thrilled with the results and- yeah thrilled with the experience because they're not listening to fucking headphones because no, nobody likes having headphones on yeah. if you don't have to. It's really, it can be a very alien space to be in. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's how they hear themselves when they're sitting in the room writing the song in the first place. That's the experience they have. And then they go into the studio and they have that same experience. Sure. It's not like the whole larger than life thing with like all the bells and whistles yeah. and the compression on. I mean, there may be compression, but they're not hearing it. Yeah. Um, and re reverbs or delays or whatever on the, like all that obviously isn't a factor, but it's really natural and it really makes them feel comfortable. I find. Yeah, and I think it causes people, like you were saying, to be careful and selective about the volume that they're playing at. Yeah, which means that it's hard. All of our volumes within that space are relatively matched, or they go together. Yeah, totally. Which I think also, as we were talking about the multi mic thing, means that those the bleed that's happening between those mics makes more sense. It does. It makes more sense, and 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 instantly you've got like the cool thing about doing that. So I did another record like that recently at Brian Adams Studio in Vancouver, called, which is called the Warehouse, and it's a beautiful studio in downtown Vancouver. It's huge, and he has an unbelievable selection of mics. It's great. It's world class. He's got George Martin's Neve console in there, and nice. it's an unbelievable place to work. But it's big, and so, 
and I and I was doing a blues record with horns. So there was like a nine piece band. I'm playing guitar. There's bass, drums, keys. The main guy who plays guitar and sings, his name's Jim Jim Burns, uh, and then a three piece horn section. And that was a that was like a real leap of faith because it's like, can we do it with horn like with a horn section? Because horn sections often have to like really blast to get that sound and like. For me to get like a good bluesy tone out of an amp, I can't have it on one because it's going to sound like shit. So like, can we really do this? And, you know, I started talking to people and listening to records and like all the records that I love that are in that style were all done like that. Every single one of them. You just have to like take a leap of faith with it at some point. And it worked really well. And the singer was like thrilled because he was comfortable for once not having to, you know, he's like, he's 72 years old or something. And he, he doesn't like, messing with the stupid headphone mixer. Like that's not his right, vibe. Totally, like, he, totally. you know, so then you end up going over there and like trying to help him with it. And it's, it's just kind of a nightmare of technical mumbo jumbo. And you just get rid of that. And suddenly, you know, it's, and, and like my guitar tone that was solved by, you know, like some trickery, like basically I, I brought in a three watt amp and I cranked the shit out of it and we put a blanket in front of it. And so it sounded good. It sounded like a big, loud, Fender Deluxe. A three watt amp. What is a three watt amp? Like an old, it's called an old, it was a vintage Fender Harvard, I think it was. It was Brian's. It's little teeny one or something? Yeah, it's tiny. It looks That's like cool, a, man. it's like a half a champ. So um, I have some new cables here in the studio that come from a company called Wire World. And they have their, their uh, really top end cable is the Oasis XLR cable. And so I, I recently took those in and I was just, I just took my, I skipped all my fancy studio stuff in here, and I just took a little PreSonus interface. Yeah, took my Roswell um, Delphos mic, which is a sort of a U67 capsule. Yeah, and just put that in front of me. One Oasis cable straight into the interface, and Beautiful. I tried some different cables and stuff. But playing the um, acoustic through that, particularly hearing it on a on this high quality cable, I like I heard details which are very interesting to me, and I, I'm making a video about this so that, that that'll probably be on my YouTube channel as this is coming out. But um, I feel like the the some of the difference in detail I heard might have been a little more challenging for me to notice Im- immediately on the just listening end. Mm-hmm. But but as the one who was playing the guitar, I really picked up on it right away. That's cool, right? You know, and, yeah. and I, w- I wanted to ask you a couple of things about that. I wanted to ask you about recording this acoustic stuff and the importance of you know, being selective about gear and making simple right choices, but also for you to talk about that, maybe that difference between um, your perspective when you're making the music versus when you're just sort of sitting back listening to it. Have you noticed that yourself too? Like sometimes you're more immediately aware of what's going on in the music. It's like on a subconscious level. Yeah. Playing an instrument. For me, it's like a whole different um, thing because I'm, I'm usually playing, like most of the stuff that I produce on, I play on. That's just how I like to be involved. Like I, I'm not really the sit back in the control room kind of guy. Occasionally I work like that, or if it's music that I don't need to be involved in, I don't force myself in it. But I work with a lot of solo artists and you know, not as many bands. I work with more solo artists where I'll bring the band in and form the band around them. And I'm part of that band usually. Um, so for me, that process is like, you know, I'm thinking about my guitar sound way more than I would if I was the producer sitting in there, you know, so I have to go, I have to go from focusing on that to trying to focus on the big picture. And when you're in the room, if there's no headphones, that's hard. If right. there, if there are headphones, then you have to um, understand that what you're hearing is filtered through a whole bunch of shit. That's not really going to be there. And, and, you know, when you go into the control room to hear something back, it's a different experience completely. But if you can anticipate that experience a little bit and know that what you're hearing in headphones in the tracking room is not what you're going to be hearing five minutes later, but if your brain can kind of fill in those blanks, I find that to be really useful. Mm -hmm. Just sort of, you know, I know that the kick drum sounds like shit in my headphones right now, but I know that drum set is going to sound cool when I walk into that room. So I just kind of like turn that critical part off because I have to be on those headphones to be yeah. able to track this song. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that answers your well, question. Well, no, exactly, I mean, just, but... just sort of 
talking about it, you know, any, yeah. any aspect of this, I think is helpful. Uh, one of the things I feel like you can notice when you don't have headphones on is you can notice that things really sound pretty good because your brain almost like drops down to a high, your, your brain becomes that, that T-bone mic pre and cranks exactly. the level of everything up mentally. And you're, and you're hearing all these details. And if you go into the control room and those details are lost, yeah. On playback, then then you do kind of notice that right away, you know? Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, for sure. But also I feel like um, when I'm playing instruments, sometimes I'm, you know, and sometimes not because there's no rules in this stuff. But <laughs> but I notice that I, I may hear notes rubbing against each other in, a, you know, uh, observe it acutely in ways that might have I might not have noticed so quickly if I was just, you know, listening in the control room and not playing. You know? Right. Or, or frequencies in a like, room that yeah. react, you know, like there might be a corner of the room that, that when you're in that room, it's like, whoa, that's freaking me out. But then you go back into the control room and it's not there. Yeah. Or sometimes, you know, you you play drums in the space and you hit it a couple of times and you're like, oh my God, that's so loud. <laughs> or that's like so brash, you know, so brassy yeah. bouncing around. Uh, but then you go listen to the mics and it's like, oh no, that's totally cool. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. So let me um, ask you about, uh, there was one of the albums, Jim Burns' Long Hot Summer Days, this blues album mm -hmm. um, th that has some great low-end kick and bass. Mm -hmm. But it's it's very subtle, but it's just right for that record is the way I would describe it. And I wonder if you just wanted to comment in general about getting the kick and the bass combo right on records for different styles of music. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest that not all records you're doing it's the same, you know, some, maybe the kick yep. is a big deal and some, maybe it's, it wouldn't sound right at all if it was up front, right. like that other record, you know? So yep. maybe you can just talk about trusting your gut about that stuff. And wh where do you get your sense of what direction to go? Uh, well, um, it's a complicated one, complicated a bit more by the fact that I really like upright bass. Um, not all the time, but good. Cause I'm going to ask you some questions about upright. <laughs> so a lot of the records that one included, that's probably half upright bass and upright bass tracked live. It's the hardest thing of the whole process. I so totally tracked agree. live in the room with the drummer and you want the bass and the kick drum to sound good and pumping, but not like pumping in a modern rock way, like pumping just in a good proper way where it feels like What if like you're recording soul coughing? Well, then, yeah, then you'd do it differently. <laughs> Sorry, throwback rock stars. <laughs> I love those records, by the way. Um, all that Chad Blake stuff was a huge influence for me, actually. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm, I will say that I am repeatedly sending emails Chad's way with the hopes that he will join us on the show. So. Yeah, he's a little reclusive, I think, right? He's just making cool records, I yeah, think. Yeah, Well, I mean... Yeah, I mean that's like the the ultimate, you know, those like a soul coughing record or the ones that I really dug were the Los Lobos records that they did, like yeah. Kiko and Colossal yeah, Head. Um, Colossal Head, uh, great, great, great record. So yeah, I mean those are like one end of the, but but those are basically rock records, and that's an electric bass, and it's that's a whole different beast. So playing, uh, so the Jim Burns record that you're talking about is half upright and half electric bass. Um, the electric would have been done with no DI, just straight out of an amp with a mic in front of the amp, um, just because we're going for like a vintage kind of sound. Yeah. And, and Do you that find that me, sometimes uh, it's just a good reminder that like always record a DI because you may need it on a lot of records, but there are also plenty of times where you don't actually want to use that DI. Mm -hmm. You just want to use that one amp. You don't like a, the trying to use the DI and the amp as in the final thing is not always helpful. No, no, it's not. And, and you definitely have to be cognizant of phase and like how to deal with that. Um, I work with a great engineer, a guy named Sheldon Zaharko in Vancouver. And so I was playing on that record. So, you know, at, we discussed it and we talked about tones and we got sounds but then I left it with him to like make sure it was all being done properly, and he, and he did. Uh, but so the bigger problem for a record like that is when there's an upright bass and there's drums and they're in the same room, and in fact they're about three feet away from each other. Right. So how do you how do you get enough separation to make it functional? Um, and there's certain things that you can do. So like obviously like we built like a little thing around his, the bridge of his base. It was like moving blankets, I think. Um, 
and uh, we probably had a 67 or something on that base. I don't really remember exactly. Um, How about the room, the size of the room that the base is in for it to just sort of speak naturally? It was, it's a huge room. Yeah. It's gigantic. So it everything vanishes. So that was the other problem with that record is we're in this massive room. Um, so we had to rein that in too, because we're all close. So we only use like a third or like a quarter of the room basically. Um, and so what we ended Would up doing- Would you literally set up the band towards a corner of the room? Um, it was kind of dictated by where the drum sounded the best. Right. Okay. So yeah, we sort of built a little thing around the drums and then we just, we all set up around that and just left the rest of the room empty. And, uh, and there was, you know, the cool thing about recording that way is like the horns that are 20 feet away from the singer, because that's just, you know, there's nine people. That's how far they ended up being away from him. Um, they become a, a vocal reverb because, you know, if you, if you don't mute those tracks when they're not playing, you get this amazing room sound that suddenly it's like, well, I don't, re I don't need to put reverb on this vocal. It already has reverb. Like there's all these cool room mics going on. So you have to, you have to watch that stuff a little bit, but things like that happen that like, there's no way you can plan for that kind of a sound. Yeah. Um, but that's what happens is it be those become room mics. So you don't need a bunch of room mics as well. You've got them already. Yeah. Um, so what we did with, so yeah, the drummer was having a hard time because he was like, I can't hear the bass because he's playing an upright bass. So we ended up plugging him into an amp and putting the amp beside the drummer um, and facing it, sort of um, just positioning it so that it wasn't being picked up by the drum mics very much, mm -hmm. but that he was hearing this amp, basically. Almost like a, a drummer's wedge. Yeah, it was like a, a, dr like a drummer wedge, basically. So, so we made that happen so that he could hear the bass, because that obviously has to lock. Yeah, totally. So that's the most important thing. So that's how we solved that problem. And I'm sure things like that happened all the time in the old days too. They just yeah, like, you know, it reminds me of the idea of what's happening in live sound on a stage. It's mm -hmm. it's called sound reinforcement because it's you know, at least in a in any size room where you're going to still hear what's coming off the stage, then what's yeah. coming out of the speakers is, you know, supposed to be basically reinforcing that sound to make it add up. Yeah, and that that approach applies in the studio sometimes too. Exactly like you just said, it's like you're trying to capture it in this natural way, but sometimes you do have to do a little bit of something to just kind of reinforce it and make it yeah. work just, just a little bit. Yeah. But we didn't throw the entire band in headphones to try and solve right. that. We just said, yeah, the drummer needs a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, to like tonally, once you have that captured and you have a great bass player, you know, he's playing like an old K or a Epiphone bass. I can't remember exactly, but it sounds great. You got a nice mic in front of it. You've got the, the drum kit, it's a nice vintage kit. You know, the sounds are all there in the room. The trick is like marrying those together when you get to the mix process. And that bass player was probably looking toward the drummer. So, yes. the, so the back of that U67 is rejecting the drum That's kit. That's right. Yeah. So there's like no, it's un, unbelievable how little bleed you get in that situation. Yeah. Even Because of the big room too. I think it's a big a room, room. And they're playing quietly. Process. The drummer's not killing the drums. Yeah. So, the, you know, that's not a problem. The problem is, is, really with upright bass and kick drum, that takes a lot of work and kind of a lot of just messing with and very fine tuning, I find, as far as like just a tiny bit of compression goes a long way. Um, I find throwing a, a tube compressor onto an upright bass, just so it's like just kind of tickling like one dB of compression regularly. It's like a really nice way to make that bass stand out with, with, um, the, uh, with a kick drum going, depending on the kick drum, of course, but, um, you know, like little things like that. And then of course, you know, ev everyone's aware of different EQ tricks and things like that, that you can do. Well, I don't know. Um, Let's talk about that for a sec. So do we think that, um, the rock stars should feel comfortable with having to really dig in with some EQ, um, on the low end of that bass, or if something's not quite right about that bass. Maybe they just need to think about repositioning the mic more. You it's know, a, just capturing that. It's a bit of both for sure. Um, I don't really like over overdoing it in the in the tracking phase with EQ. I like to really try and fix the problem with the mics and the positioning at the time. But in, undoubtedly, when I bring that back to my own studio, so that's what happened in that in that situation. Is we were at Brian Adams' studio to to record it, and then I brought it back here. Uh, to Nashville to mix it. 
And um, so, you know, you get into a different studio and everything sounds a little different. And then you start noticing like little things. Right, and totally. There yeah. are problems crop up. Well, so sure. not that not to put you on the spot to remember exactly what you did, but what are some of the tools you might have reached for for EQing the uh the low end and getting it right between the kick and that that upright when you were back here? Um high pass filter goes a long way, you know, like just getting rid of some of that crazy With like probably mush. a gentle slope. Uh it? yeah, like I don't know. Or sometimes just go for it. 18 dB. <laughs> yeah. Kind of in that range, I'd say and and like with an upright bass, there's quite a bit of like you're not going for like a really modern fat like in that kind of way sound. You're going for something more natural. So there's quite a bit of room to like get rid of stuff down in the very, very low end. You know, you don't need to be super um, conservative about about carving some of that low end away because the the upright bass doesn't have a lot of great information down in the yeah and it does have a lot of low end of it it's a real like it like does a, yeah it um, has a lot like of like a woof yeah for right? sure so if you're able to capture that with mic placement and distance you know that's it, it's all a careful thing really yeah I'd almost describe the difference between an electric bass and the upright as electric has low end but it's like doom and it's sustaining of that note that you're really hearing down low whereas upright yeah. All this information in the low is just like a, a yeah. thump. Yeah. It's a rush of the attack of the string. I also really like that Universal Audio plugin. Um, what the hell's it called? The um it's emulating that um Is it the upright basifier plugin? <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> it's the one that it's the one it's like a compressor, but it kind of it it's doing its own oh, thing. Oh, like a dynamic EQ kind of thing? No, it's not an EQ. It 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 basically lets you uh um, alter the attack or the release of oh you like a, um, um, a transient design yeah transient yeah, design yeah. I find that really useful on an upright bass um, to ex deal with that issue exactly of you have a lot of attack with the upright but not that sustain that, that you get with an electric bass yeah interesting so okay, with an cool. upright bass you can like I don't want to totally unacoustify it but you can bring out the tone of the decay a little bit more using a plugin like that. That's a really good plugin for an upright bass, actually. Nice. Um, so, and that I find combined with some sort of tube compression is, is nice. And, and then EQ, um, yeah, the high pass filter goes a long way for sure. Oh. Also on the kick drum. The, the other one that I really like these days is that I can't even remember that what, what that one's called. The, the, it's not like nocturne, but it's like, it's like a thing that does everything automatically in quotations for you. Uh, it's, oh, is it's that from Isotope? Isotope. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I never like yep. what it does, but I I frequently will turn it on just to see what it... Neutron. Yeah, the Neutron. Yeah, the Neutron. I don't like what it does in general. So I only turn it on just to see. I'm just like, I'm curious what Mr. Neutron thinks about this. And I'll put it on. And, so, and occasionally... Or quite often, like what it does show you amazingly, like you put the plug in on the kick drum and the bass, and it shows you where the clashes are. And that's an interesting thing to be aware of. It's not always right, and it's not always a bad thing, but it does show you like technically what's going wrong, and then it processes it. And I, that's the part that I don't like. Like I don't like all the EQing and the compression. I generally don't but agree it's like with an its eye decisions. Opener. But it's a bit of an eye opener. Yeah, and it's you're like, a great tool. I almost always put it on both those tracks, and then I just disable them after. But yeah, I always cool. kind of check cool. them out. I think that's just really helpful. And and I think that you know as you spend more and more time mixing and recording, and you begin to really learn and appreciate the measurement tools. You know mm -hmm. anything that like it's not. You're not using it to change things, but you're you're beginning to really value your meters, yeah, and your frequency response, you know, real time analyzer and things like that. And they, yeah, and it can be a time saver too. You know, like if I've got the bass going through a Pultec EQ, and and I turn on the Neutron, and it's like it's like you can see right there, like like I can hear that there's a problem, and I know it's in the low end. But then with the Neutron, it's like there's this big clash happening at 60 hertz or something. And then, then I know like, oh, well, I'll, you know, like if I'm messing around between 100 and 60 and 30 on the Pultec, I'll know that 60, you know, even though I can hear it, it's just like, that's, 
that's a speedy little tool where I can just kind of focus on that. It may not be right either, but it, it's a good starting point. I oh, find. That's cool. Well, hey, Rockstars, we're going to take a break now for a second. We'll come back in for the jam session. Um, a reminder that if you go in the show notes on your mobile device, you can click through um, or just go to the website, rsrockstars.com. Use the magnifying glass, search for Steve Dawson. It'll take you right to the blog post. I will include a YouTube playlist right there so you can go listen to some of these records we're talking about and um, find links to Steve's work and, and his website and stuff. And then one last reminder also, if you're also at a stage where you're learning how to mix right now, I do have a free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com, which is also in the show notes. And you can go take that and uh, you get free downloadable multi-tracks of my instrumental song. And uh, I show you how to mix in your DAW with free plugins just to give you, you know, some good starting points. So we'll see you in a sec for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Supa Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Steve Dawson, joining us, a Canadian um, native and Nashville resident now, making all kinds of cool, beautiful sounding records. You ready to jam? Let's jam. All right, so we're going to jump in and, and ask some more questions about your records and, and instruments and then kind of close out with some of my usual questions. But um, guitar amps, um, how do you like to mic guitar amps and do you have any tips for mixing electric guitars? Um, guitar amps, I like small. Um, I, I Honestly, I don't see the need for gigantic guitar amps. So um, like a Fender Deluxe is about as big as I get. That's a, you know basically like a 15 watt amp. Um, deluxe. Is, is the deluxe only 15 watts? Maybe it's 20, it's but such I, a great I think it's 14 or 15. Amp, yeah. Um, I could be wrong. It's definitely not more than 20. Uh, what do the rock stars need to know about wattage and does low wattage, high wattage automatically mean quiet or loud? Or yeah, is it, it does, it but does. it's not relative. Like a, like a 20 watt amp is not four times louder than a five watt amp. So it, it is, but yeah, like a 50 watt amp is really flipping loud. Um, whereas a, a 20 watt amp is reasonable. Um, let me ask you this question. So one of the lessons I feel like I've learned here and there is that you can have an amp that, um, you can have a big amp that doesn't work so well in the studio. Mm -hmm. You can have a studio amp that works great, but then you find yourself on a stage and you hit your guitar and it just <laughs> dies like a little, you know, like a, yeah. a little kitten or something, you know, yeah. maybe talk about amp. So how would you educate somebody about just generally speaking, what are some amp things you need to think about if that, you know, different size rooms, stages, stuff like that? Um, well, stages are just, it's an entirely different thing, you know, like it depends on what kind of music you're playing. It depends on how loud the band is playing. You know, if I'm playing pedal steel or guitar for somebody and I bring a deluxe to the gig, which is, uh, I think a 15 watt amp, it's plenty loud enough, but if the band's really loud, suddenly it becomes not loud enough or else I have to turn the amp up so much that everything starts overdriving more than I want it to. Um, but there's a sweet spot with all amps, you know, uh, a deluxe I keep bringing up is kind of a perfect sized amp for gigs and for, you know, unless you're playing a stadium, but you know, most people I know aren't doing that. Although I know a few people that are, but in general, you know, that's going to be, if you're playing a house concert or if you're playing a 500 seat club, a deluxe is more than enough. Um, but then, you know, you go and see someone like Junior Brown playing, who's a wicked guitar and steel player, and he's playing two Fender Twins, which are 50 watts each. And it's just like... Yeah, and they're loud. Making, they're they loud, loud, and he pins them. 
<laughs> so like, who am I to say that a deluxe is loud enough? I don't know. But yeah, like if if you've got a deluxe and you put it on two, it's not really doing what it's supposed to. Like you need to turn that sucker up. And that's why having a smaller amp is better, really, I think. So like a Princeton is even better still. They're, so for me, like I tour a lot and I get backline amps a lot and they can always backline me a deluxe, every, no matter where. If it's in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan or Nashville, you can always get a deluxe reverb. Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. <laughs> I like that, man. That's like uh, yeah. Buck Snort, Tennessee. Yeah. So, you know, they're available. That's why I default to them. But actually, I prefer a Princeton, which is like a deluxe, but like four or five watts less. And you can turn that up to like seven and make it sound really great. And it's, you know, you could play it in this room at seven and it would be loud, but not crazy loud. How about a Fender Champ? That's also a pretty handy one to have in the studio. Yeah, Champ's even smaller. The Champ is, I think, five watts. Um, And then the one that I always use in my studio a lot is called the Pro Junior, which was like the kind of the 90s version. And that thing's wicked, you know, and that's like a five watt amp as well. Any good mods for the Pro Junior or should just keep it stock? No, the Pro Junior was actually a work of art, I think. It was a brilliant amp that they just stopped making. It's it's it was like the small cousin of the Blues Junior, which is also right. cool, but yeah. not as cool as the Pro Junior. And it just has volume and tone and nothing else. It doesn't have reverb or anything. So to recap that, I would say uh, Rockstar is one of the first things I learned was uh, you know once I started getting into recording and I wasn't trying to be on stages, I remember trading in my big amp <laughs> for a few little amps because I had gone into other studios and I learned those little amps where you get really cool tones out of totally. recording. Yeah. And then I think a good takeaway from what you just said is like, if you want to sort of, um, and I think these are important questions, if you're not necessarily the gigging guitar player yourself, but you're trying to start collect some useful things for your studio, that it's okay to get these little amps that you think sound cool and have them around. They can be really useful. And then if you need to, you know, sort of also hit the threshold of, I could take this out on a gig, then Deluxe is Deluxe is like the perfect one, yeah. And I, uh, the other one that I always use is a Swart which uh, I can't remember where they're made, Texas maybe or something. Um, but those are, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to ask for a Swart in backline and actually get one. So um, it's the kind of thing I use it around Nashville when I'm here and I use it in the studio all the time. I love it. It's a little smaller than a deluxe. Um, it's called the Atomic Space Tone. Looks cool too, but nice. nobody ever sees it because it's usually locked away somewhere. But I, I use that a lot. <laughs> How do you like to mic your amps in the studio? Uh, I like some distance. Um I would never listen to a guitar amp with my head jammed up against it, which is where it usually gets mic'd. So I like like at least a foot between the mic and the amp, uh, preferably more, like maybe even two or three feet would be ideal. Okay, so now I imagine as soon as you start backing away from the amp, the room and the space around the amp starts to become more and more important. Uh, it does, but it, to me it just sounds more like what I want to hear out of a guitar amp. Okay, cool. Um, I don't want to hear all that immediate sound that comes directly off the cone. I want it to develop and the sound to progress in space. And that's what happens. Have you ever mic'd a guitar amp from the same spot where your ear would be if you were just playing in that room? Has that ever been yeah. an approach? Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I mean, in general, it'll be down at speaker level um, pointing at the amp. It doesn't, it's not as big of a factor, you know, like if you're talking about whether it's right on the cone or whether it's you know on the side or how it's right when you back up when you back up those yeah it doesn't matter as much and often i'll put a couple of mics on i really like a royer ribbon and and i don't really use 57s i I use those um ear trumpet labs mics again those are condensers that sound great on electric guitar amps um i'll use a 57 if i need to um you know if i'm using a bunch of mics on other things i like a so 57 even two feet away can sound cool yeah totally cool yeah yeah Absolutely. Um, Cole's 4038 sounds great on a guitar yeah. amp, but yeah, yeah. Y- you can't put that right, right up to the Right, because the Cole's has a huge proximity effect too, so it yeah. to get really And you'll blow it out. Yeah. The moving air from the speaker will blow out a Cole's 4038 yeah. really easily. So you That's have probably to- probably what happened to mine before. <laughs> <laughs> you could pop screen it too, yep. you know, but if you just back it up a foot or two, it'll be fine. And those sound great. Um, so I'm not super picky, or like I'll experiment- And oftentimes, as with other sources, like even like vocalists and stuff, I'll put two or three mics up and leave them up um, as options, basically. Um, But I commit early on. I'll 
usually delete stuff I don't like or, or just get rid of it altogether. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm not super picky. I, I don't have a go-to mic really. For, okay, as cool, far as electric cool. guitars. Yeah, go. but I think that was really insightful. Even just hearing you say it's okay to back a 57, you know, two feet away from an amp. Sounds and great. See what that yeah. sounds like. That's yeah. a huge thing. Totally. I think that's huge insight. Um, because we get scared of stuff like that. You we know, do. We, we like, we think we're supposed to do it one way and then we're like, well, well, you can't do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good to know that you could, you know? Well, I think a lot of the best guitar tones ever were done with no close miking at all. Yeah. I mean, I remember hearing stories about the stones being down at Muscle Shoals mm -hmm. and, you know, doing brown sugar. And it was just like a U67 on five Keith's feet away guitar amp, you sure. know, I don't remember how far away, but still, yeah. You know, well, that's, that's a great, like, like a, if I had U67s to put on guitar amps, I would do that. So you're saying sure. I should start using my U67 <laughs> a little more often on the guitar? Amp. I would totally use that on guitar, yeah. Um, what about the floor uh, between the guitar amp and the mic? Hardwood, rug, and does any of that matter? Yeah, you know, it's different. Yeah, you can experiment with that. Uh, I'll generally put a rug down, you know, just to not be overly reflective with yeah. it because that can, or you could have like a packing blanket and just like scoot yeah. it underneath and just see if that. Yeah. That stuff's pretty easy to, for me, that's like, you can make that decision in one second. You can right. just be like, nah, that sounds too weird. And then throw a blanket down and get rid of that reflection thing. And it, that's a easy decision. Let's talk about making quick decisions in the studio. How often are you the only one who's doing this recording and you got to run out and do the move and then run back in and listen um, and versus do you ever work with an assistant or somebody that's got a pair of headphones and you can just request things and hear hear the result right away? I, I do both. Um, I don't trust my, if I'm in the room playing, which I frequently you am. You don't trust your assistant? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't trust my head my headphones is what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I don't trust that what I'm hearing in my cans coming out of a headphone mixer is really accurate. But I know roughly that it's going to be good or not. And so I can trust that. Um, yeah, I'll have an assistant sometimes at my place. Sometimes I do everything, engineering, producing, and playing, which is frankly ridiculous, but that's just the reality of the situation sometimes. sometimes. Yeah. Um, or like if I'm working at Brian Adams' place, then frequently my Make friend- Make Brian do it. Yeah, yeah Brian, <laughs> wash, my, wash my socks. Uh, <laughs> then, you know, I'm working with my friend Sheldon, who I mentioned, and he's really fast and yeah, he'll come and do whatever- whatever we need to do to change, to get whatever sound. So yeah, I mean, it's nice. It's good as a producer to know what needs to be done. I think these days, back in the old days, producers didn't have to know that kind of stuff. Now I think we do. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think that it's very easy to find yourself doing all the jobs, you know, mm -hmm. the engineer, the producer, the assistant, all of it yeah. and the playing too. Well, and, you yeah. know, it's almost like you've got that much more to have to learn and figure out now. It's it's also really hard to get gigs, I think, these days without multiple skill sets. If you're not an established guy, if you're if you're not like a big famous producer that's going to get work no matter what, um, and you have a limited skill set, or not limited, I mean, you can be a great producer and not play an instrument and not know how to EQ anything. It's just that would be really hard to develop that career now. Yeah. It w it, I just it, want to be a famous producer who doesn't know how to EQ anything and gets work no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> I have worked with guys like that. And and it's awesome because really like the things that they bring to a session are like really impressive. Like their way of like, you know, managing personalities and, and doing the stuff that they know how to do and leaving all the technical mumbo jumbo to other people. I yeah. think I, that's cool. It's just it's kind of a dying breed, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's always fascinating to work with new people in different situations and become aware of how positive it can be, you know, how, how yeah. things, great things can still get done in ways that you hadn't experienced before totally. or didn't expect. Yeah. All right. So um, one of the people that you listed working with Matt Chamberlain, the drummer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you share a story about working with Matt? I've heard some stories about him before. And he, you know, was described as being um, really thinking outside the box and doing mm -hmm. some cool stuff on a session. Just share a story about working with Matt or maybe tell the rock stars who he is. Uh, Matt Chamberlain is a drummer who I got to know a little bit when he lived in Seattle. He lives in L.A. now uh, and he's in Nashville a lot. He plays on tons of the new country, the big new country stuff. Um, and But back in the day, he started by playing on the Wallflowers and Edie Burkell's records 
and then became. Did he do uh, shooting rubber bands at the stars? That no, one? that's the first one, and he did Ghost of a Dog, which is the second one. Uh, and then he did the Big Wallflowers record, and then the floodgates kind of opened, and then he hooked up with John Bryan, who's one of my favorite producers, and did all the like John Bryan soundtracks, like oh, cool, um, cool. I Heart Huckabees and um, Punch Drunk Love and stuff. That's a thanks um, for reminding me to invite John Bryan on the podcast. Good luck with that, but yeah, get him on here. He doesn't really ever talk to humans. Let's go sit on his doorstep <laughs> until he agrees to that. <laughs> Um, I'll start by getting a map of the stars. <laughs> um, okay, so so uh, any interesting stuff you learned from Matt about? You know, yeah, you know. So anyway, I got to out. love Matt's sound like by listening to you know those soundtrack records and um, like Fiona Apple records that I thought were really cool that Matt played on and stuff. And I loved his drumming. And um, a, the bass player that I was playing with was in Fiona Apple's band. His name was Keith Lowe, and Keith Keith and Matt played in Fiona's touring band. And so that's how I got to know Matt was through my friend Keith. And so we did some work on um, a couple of records um, in Seattle. And uh, I remember going to the studio thinking like, well, I don't really know how he gets that wicked sound that he gets on all those records, but you know, we'll, we'll just do what we can to try and make that happen or, or basically you're, I, I just, to, you're, you're worried that you're going to fuck this whole thing up and like totally like everybody else has made amazing you know yeah. groundbreaking records now you got the same drummer and you're going to just screw up the recording of yeah it entirely. absolutely and then and then he gets into the room and i'm walking in the room and he's tuning his drums a little bit and messing around with them um and he starts playing and his drums and I'm just like that's how he, that's how he gets the sound. That's the sound. That's it. There's nothing. There was no. It was like that. I could tell in an eighth of a second that that was Matt Chamberlain if I had a blindfold on, and so I realized I could stick a 57 in the room and it would it would basically be like 80 percent there that's because cool. it's because it's him. So what I really learned was that you know like an amazing drum sound like that is due to an amazing drummer named Matt. <laughs> More than any microphone or expensive preamp, I could literally record him with a 57 into a Mackie and sound, and it would sound like pretty damn good. Like I like pretty my close. 57 into a Mackie. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've, I've said this before on the podcast, and I'll, I'll just say it again really quickly, but I, I think it's uh, the drummer from the meters is Zigaboo, I think. Zigaboo right? Model East, yeah. Right. So, and, and there was a, a special done. PBS thing where they were going and, and pairing them up with um, uh, bright lights or somebody somebody mm -hmm. like that one of the DJs and um, and he's it's just like he's setting up his drums and he's in this room and just the camera is walking around and points the camera and the camera mic over the and he starts playing it and it was the same thing I was like well shit that's the sound right yeah. there that's it you yeah. know and it was really uh, eye or ear opening to me yeah. at that point yeah um, so then let's flip that around so when you remember that. Um, do you have any stories or lessons you want to share from saying, all right, well, if that's the case, I'm not going to bring in the wrong musician on this and try and manipulate it to sound like the right musician. I'm just going to say, like, if I could have this musician on this mm -hmm. record, I would do it. Um, do you have any stories about, like, you know, you know, nervously reaching out to a musician that you wanted to invite in on a project and, and, uh, and, and having and, that work or whatever? Endlessly. That like my whole life has been asking people out of the blue, who I assume would say no, and they end up saying yes. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, and will that happen to the rest of us too? <laughs> uh, I don't know. If you go and ask them enough times, yeah, you there's know. only one thing you can guarantee: if you don't ask them, then they're then, not going to show no up. Is the answer they will for not sure. be there. They will not be there. I don't. You know, like recently, yeah, like um, working with Jay Belleros, that was. Um, basically a cold call. He didn't know me. Um, he had, I think, an idea that I wasn't a total Looney Tune from some people. Um, but I was working on a record for a guy named Matt Pattershuck. We were starting to talk about making this record and and we named a couple drummers that we thought would be perfect. Stephen Hodges was one of them. Um, Matt's name came up and Jay Belarosa's name was, I guess, at the top of the list. And um, 
we were like, yeah, it would be great if we could get somebody like Jay Belleros. And then I was like, well, why don't we see if we can get Jay Belleros? And the, so I I phoned him and- See, I've experienced a little of that too. And sometimes it's easier when somebody else says that and then, then we as the producer go, well, let's just get him, you know? Or yeah, I mean, I don't look, know if it's easier, you, but- Then just, you look like a rock star. Then you look really cool, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, and I just, so I just reached out to him. He didn't know what he was getting into. You know, kudos to him for- being like, yeah, I'll come up to Canada and make a record for somebody I've never heard of before. Sure. Nice, because yeah, you got travel. But he wanted to know stuff. what the music was like, and he listened to it, and he and he definitely was informed by the time he got up there about what was going on. But basically, just coming in on a session where he didn't know anybody and taking a leap of faith. Um, so I I do that all the time. I reach out to people all the time that I just think would be great to have. Um, and this a, is a situation of working, starting with the artist and then outfitting them with the band for the studio. That's right. For yeah. example, maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, do you have a process that you like to go through? You kind of described that a little bit, like they said something, you said, well, why don't we just call them, you know? Uh, but when the band arrives, have you sometimes said, let's rehearse these songs with the band. Uh, have you sometimes done that and been like, that was a big fat waste of time. Let's just start recording the songs. And maybe any, you want to talk around that process of pairing up an artist with a band of your, your and the artist selection yeah. and, and doing it right. Um, I've stopped doing that basically. Like the whole idea of like re rehearsing stuff to me throws all the good stuff out the window and all the good stuff happens like in the early takes. And if you're rehearsing it and like getting things under your belt, it's cool. It's good to know the material. As the producer, I know the material. I'm not worried about that from my end of things. Although I never really know for sure what I'm going to play. Like I might play pedal steel on a song. I might play an acoustic guitar. I might play something else. I don't know. I, I don't make those decisions until things start happening in the room. But uh, we don't rehearse because I think that that's where all the good stuff happens. I want that to be the record. And you brought in great musicians who are fast. Yeah, they're and not going to. Yeah, they're not going to be way better on the tenth take than they were on the second take. They're probably going to be way better on the second take than they yeah. are on the tenth take. Because by then they're bored, going like, "Why are we doing this ten times?" So, what are some of your responsibilities as a producer and a coordinator to make sure that everybody, ha you know, that there is a page for everybody to be on together when it's time to press record? Um, I mean, are you writing out charts, for example? Yeah, for I, yeah I write charts. Like um, a guy like Jay Belleros doesn't read charts. He reads lyrics. Um, he only wants lyrics, which I thought was amazing. He's a drummer, and all he wants is the lyrics. I, I think that's really cool to hear. I've talked about that before, that to me, the um, lyrics inform the drums and the guitar mm -hmm. strums. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And so, but, for, but you know... That's cool if you're the drummer, but it's not cool if you're the bass player. Right. <laughs> right. Because, you know, you need to play the right bass notes. Right. That's right. Okay. So that's, that's so, another comment we can make too, is uh, there's one instrument that always has to be there at the beginning of each chord and can't like play the wrong note on, wrong note on the way to the right note. And it's the bass. The bass right? kind of needs a chart. Yeah. If he doesn't, if he's not part of the band and I'm bringing him in for a session for a song that he's never heard, or maybe he's heard once in passing, uh, he's going to need a chart if we're going to be able to pull it off in two or three takes. And I'm not saying like, I want to do it in two or three takes because I want to get the hell out of there and go home or that I want to get the record done quickly. Although getting the record done quickly is often important these days because people don't have budgets really like they used to. But that aside, we're not rushing. We take our time. Like I don't usually record more than two songs in a day. So those those takes are like peppered with breaks and like listening really critically and taking time off for like half an hour and then coming back and really listening and really thinking about how we could do something better. Um, it's just that rarely does it get better by the 20th take. So yeah. we just don't really get there usually. Only Although sometimes. The Beatles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you had unlimited studio time, I'm sure we would do 30 or 50 Well, what, they spent six months doing um, Sgt. Peppers and then didn't they break up after that anyway? So, <laughs> um, all right. So, um, cool, cool. Uh, writing out charts for the band. If a rock star is not familiar, if, if somebody doesn't have the skills for chart writing yet, yeah. where would you send them? How would you uh, tell them to go learn how to write charts well? Um, 
Well, I mean, when I moved to, so when I was in Vancouver, I wrote charts on Sibelius. I just learned how to use Sibelius. It's really, um, it's not that hard. You just have to learn it like any other program. And I wrote charts that way. So when I think of charts, I think of, you know, one, two, dash, yeah. four, well, we, we don't have five. that in Vancouver. Like that okay. literally is the Nashville system. And I didn't even know about it until I moved here. Well, I'd heard, I mean, uh, yeah, I know what it is. I knew what the Nashville number system was. I always just thought like, eh, that it's, it's not really specific enough. I'm going to like write the charts in Sibelius that have, you know, the exact thing that I want everyone to play and all the repeats and all the codas and all this shit. And they get rhythmic information in there and everything. Yeah, they can. not Like I'll put some of that stuff in less and less as I went along. Like in the early days, I was like writing in bass lines and things like that. And I stopped doing that eventually when I right. realized that a good bass player had way better ideas than I ever did. Yeah, so yeah. Um, those gradually just became basically like chord charts. But they had repeats and second endings and codas and jump to blah, blah, blah. And like when you're working with a singer-songwriter that doesn't really, that isn't versed in theory or or music knowledge, they're going to have like a bar of three or they're going to have a section or a verse that's identical to the last verse except for one bar. You know how frustrating that is like on a on a Sibelius chart, like <laughs> making one bar different in a verse? It's It's virtually impossible to effectively write that. And then I come down here, and I always sort of resisted the Nashville chart thing. I was like, eh, I want it, I want it to be more professional looking or something. And then it's like, oh, I totally got it. As soon as I got here, and everyone just used those, it totally works. Like, so you have to. I mean, to write a Nashville chart, there's a format for it. It's really easy. It's just numbers correlate. And the reason that they came up with it is so that they could change keys, you know, Easy, without, yeah. without, without having to rewrite the chart. the chart. So you have to know your theory uh, basics. You have to know enough basic theory to know that if you're in the key of G, the two chord is an A minor. Like you have to know that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not but rocket if you're science. in the key of C, that was the six minor. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So you have to kind of know some basics and then, you know, like I can do a chart as I'm listening to a song for the first time, I can write a Nashville chart as I'm listening now. See, that's what I've seen talented musicians do in the studio. And it just blew me away, you know? It, it's impressive looking. And then once you can do it, it's like just writing a, it's just like writing a sentence. It's, yeah. And um, that just comes with practice. It comes with practice. Yeah. Like, and somebody tell I, I me know you what wrote the, the fucking what chart I, wrong. So, yeah, so you get it right. <laughs> I know what the what a chord changing from a C to a G. I know I know what that sounds like. So I can just go one five, and that's what that means. But you don't get that overnight. Some people do, but not very many. You know, some yeah. people have perfect pitch, but not very many. And so you you just develop your ear to the point where you can do that. You shouldn't expect to be able to do it overnight. And maybe you need to labor over your Nashville charts for three hours a piece figuring out, oh, that goes C to F to A minor for two bars. And maybe that takes you a long time, but I guarantee you if you do it over and over again, you'll get it really fast. Um, quick question. When you're writing the chart, if you listen to it playing back over an iPhone speaker, do you sometimes miss misread the chords because you're not hearing yeah, the low end in yeah. it. So like you want to hear it on a speaker that's actually where you get a I, little I, bit I of I bass. always use earbuds when I'm doing national And earbuds charts. make it maybe a little easier because more detail. Yeah. Okay, cool. It just that's lets me hear the the what, the context better because it's really easy to mishear stuff like on a laptop speaker. Yeah. You, you think you're hearing a G major and it's really an E yeah, minor. Yeah, my brain will make all up all kinds of chords totally. in a song. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, cool. So... um Let's see. Uh, we already talked about that. Um, another per group, not person, but persons you've recorded are the McCrary sisters, mm -hmm. um, a wonderful group of singers here in Nashville, really incredible resource yeah. for, you know, those of us making records here. Can you introduce to the rock stars who they are and also talk about what it means to record gospel kind of group vocals or, or I don't know how you recorded them in this situation, but talk mm -hmm. about the the best ways to approach a session like that when you've brought in singers like they are. Okay, well, the McCrary sisters are a family group. Obviously, there's five sisters. They perform as five, but they, they'll do sessions as one, two, or three, or four, depending on what you need and what you want. Um, I use them very frequently as a three-piece backup vocal um, group, and they're awesome. So... 
Anne, I think, is the oldest sister. I'm not really sure of the age situation, but Anne is the one that I usually um, set up the sessions with, and she's really a, a very nice person and easy to work with. And then um, her sister, Regina, I'm always sort of in awe of because she has like this crazy history. Like she was in Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder Review and all this crazy stuff. And so she's, and she's really funny. Uh, and then there's Alfreda is another sister. Those are the three that I work with um, regularly. And well, I mean, not regularly, but quite often um, I bring them in to sing on records. And um, so I also have a history recording vocal gospel stuff in Vancouver. There was a group called the Sojourners and they were a band that started as a backup group for another record I was doing. And we all kind of like came up with this idea for their band and started this band called the Sojourners. So it was three singers. Uh, one of them was in his late seventies and the other guys were like around six, mid sixties or early sixties or something. Um, so considerably older than I was. And they knew obviously way more than I did. They grew up in churches in the States. One was from Texas, one was from Louisiana and one was from Detroit. And they grew up with this kind of music. I didn't, uh, I knew nothing about gospel, I, but I'd listened to a shit ton of it. I'd listened to all kinds of golden gate quartet and, Dixie Hummingbirds. So I knew what, I knew a lot about that kind of music and I wanted to be able to capture it. Uh, so anyway, the whole point of that thing really is like thinking of it, I think, as one instrument rather than three specific voices. So yeah, yeah. you're not going to go in and like fine tune and like auto tune one guy. Like sometimes they're a little pitchy, not re really with the McCrary sisters. They're not really that pitchy ever. Uh, sometimes with the Sojourners, they were like one of them might be pitchy or something, but like you just go with it because yeah. that's, it's just like an instrument. So, well, you know, and then also tuning, um, I think this is important. So in the same way that, you know, those Bon Jovi records with perfect triple tuning, <laughs> yeah. um, have a quality to the chord, the, um, the, you know, when, when there, when some things are slightly pushed around tuning wise, it, things can th sound thicker. Yeah. And cool. Yeah. And it sounds cool. Like a little out of tunes, not bad. A lot of those old like if you took a choir of people and everyone was perfectly in auto tuned, it probably wouldn't sound, it would sound like creepy. a choir anymore. No, it, it would sound creepy. Totally. Uh, so, you know, when I started working with the Sojourners, it was I treated them as three separate vocalists. But what I came to realize was that it was more of a one sound. So I would just stick one mic in the middle of them, an omnidirectional microphone, and then sometimes have a stereo pair as well back from them. So I'd have this sort of image of, of the whole thing. And the McCrary's are the same thing. Would you have them facing forward in a semicircle as if they were on stage towards an audience in the stereo mics, or would you have them in a circle around the omni mic? Uh, like a semicircle around the omni mic, yeah. Um, in the case of the McCrary, sometimes I work with just Anne and Regina, and in that case, I'll put a like a bi-directional pattern on a fifth or on a forty-nine or something, and have them facing each other. Um, you know, if you take one voice out of that situation, everything falls apart. Like it's not meant to be to have one singer and then another one stacked on top and then another one stacked on top. They work as a unit, and you have to capture it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, um, plus microphones love that shit. Yeah. They like that. I've heard people say that air is the best mixer. Yeah. Like when you, when you put three vo voices into one microphone, it's awesome. Like the sound is so much cooler than three different microphones. Yeah. Now, how do you treat the headphone situation in a, in something like that and make it so that they're very comfortable hitting their best pitch and blending and all that kind of stuff? Um, I leave that up to them. They're good about blending. Um, some I also know with the McCrary's, I've worked with them enough where I really know the voices and I know who's who. That can be hard is like being able to pick out. But like I know Anne is the low voice. Um, I know Regina's in the middle and I know Alfreda's on the top. And I so I can tell and I'll say, oh, I need just a little bit more Regina. And so she'll move in a little bit. And that's all there is to it, really. Yeah. But they judge that stuff. Is it easier to tell them that you need more of somebody, or than it is to tell them you need less of somebody? <laughs> no, no, they're 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 pros. They, there's no ego or anything with them, and they just like to joke around yeah. too. You know, like it's all pretty loose. Well, that's cool, man. All right, well, let's keep jumping forward. Still got some more questions. So, um, 
you play lots of different instruments. Um, <coughs> you talked about uh, playing the Weizenborns, marxophones, pedal steel, pump organs, other odd antique instruments. Tell us what a marxophone is. It's a it's a really cool thing, and I've only seen one, and it was broken. <laughs> It's the weirdest instrument ever. Um, I don't think you could, well, you probably could get really good at it if you, it's mostly like a color instrument, um, but it's like a zither. Uh, it's like a, for those that don't know what I'm talking about, it's like a wooden chamber. It's like, an, it looks like an auto harp. Right. So if you know what an auto harp is, that's what it kind of looks like, but it's square instead of like an auto harp's like at an angle. Yeah, so, so an auto harp is like got all this, many, many strings because it's got every note in the scale yeah, or something yeah. like that. And so, so the left side of the marxophone is courses of strings that are tuned however you want, but they're meant to be tuned to chords. So there's like a C major chord, a G major chord, a D major chord, and then there's some minor triads. They're all in clusters, and they're really finicky and really hard to deal with. So in general, I don't use those that much. But then the real, the crazy part about the marxophone is, so then it then it's a chromatic scale up on the right side of the instrument from, I think it's two octaves from G to G, I think is what it is. So you've got two octaves to, to mess with, and each note of the chromatic scale is two strings. So it's kind of like a mandolin in that way. Yeah. It, and, and they're not octaves like some mandolin strings. They are unisons. So you've got a G, two Gs, two G sharps, two As, like that, going up the chromatic scale twice. And then halfway up the string is a button that you push... And it activates a weird flappy hammer <laughs> on a flappy hammer on a piece of loose metal. It's like like a, I don't even know how to describe it, but it activates that. And so what happens is it just the hammer hits the pair of strings, and it and it flaps against the strings. As, and you, but you can control it by how hard and how long you hold it down for. So it's a really interesting sound. So it doesn't hit it once. It doesn't just go ding. Yeah, it's like it's because, like a mandolin player playing tremolo on a yeah. note. You know, like it's a repeated strike, but only as long as gravity allows. Right. Like eventually it runs out. It's yeah. not it, it's not electric at all. So yeah. there's no power. So it it'll hit it ten times or whatever, and then it'll just run out. It's cool. It's a very cool sound. I mean, yeah. you could really layer something, and it's great. You know, all in of a all, sudden, you're transported uh, to pet sounds or something. Totally. Like that, you know? And I think there is one on pet sounds, and I'm guessing there must be. I mean, I'm pretty along sure with the there bass is harmonica. Yeah. Um, so another instrument that you play is the pedal steel. Mm -hmm. um, I I think it's one of those instruments that that we're incredibly honored to be able to you know, record and hear and work with here in Nashville, Tennessee. There's a lot yeah, of pedal steel players. There are. And it's as vast and complex an instrument as, as a, you know, grand piano is um, and yeah. capable of all kinds of stuff. Maybe give the rock stars a, a brief introduction. If somebody hasn't really seen one or you wanted to explain kind of the workings of a pedal steel, mm -hmm. give us a brief explanation of what a pedal steel is. Well, it, I mean, it basically evolved from the guitar that got flipped over and became a lap steel in the 40s. Um, and it was a six-string lap steel. Uh, it was used in Western swing music. So if you go and listen to Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys or or um, Spade Cooley or any of those kind of Western swing artists from the 40s into the 50s, you will hear the lap steel. And it's a six-string instrument. And then uh, a guy named Jerry Bird picked picked up and he was playing with Hank Williams and doing a bunch of sessions around Nashville and got into like Hawaiian stuff, moved to Hawaii. Uh, and he sort of like developed this whole electric Hawaiian thing. Then there was the traditional Hawaiian players like Saul Hoopy and King Benny Nawahi who were playing more acoustic, but still lap steel. And are those, um, forgive any dumb questions, but generally speaking, if we think about six chords... Is yeah. that part of that whole Hawaiian? Yeah, so, well, yeah, th th there's different tunings. Uh, but basically, in the old traditional acoustic Hawaiian, they're playing a major tuned chord, like a G chord or an A chord. But that developed very quickly, and and there's different variations. There's like an E11 tuning and a B13 tuning. But then Jerry Bird kind of developed this C6 tuning. And so the C6 is a tuning that's six strings, and then he changed his guitar setup and got an eight string. So he kind of was the first guy that made it eight string lap. So it's it's like a guitar still, but there's eight strings. So he could have a wider range of the C6 tuning. Yeah. 
And then in the 50s, uh, a guy named um, Webb Pierce uh, had a hit with a song called Slowly, which you should check out. That's that's basically known as the first pedal steel song. So that was the the steel player on that wanted to change tunings, but he it was so finicky doing it with the tuning pegs that he developed this system of with pedals changing the um, the tuning by hitting certain pedals. So it was really invented as a way of chain of altering tunings. But of course, so what happened was the lever the foot pedal activated a lever which tightened the string to a fixed amount. It's not rocket science, but it was a lot of... It kind of rotates the bridge or something, right? Yeah. Well, back in those days, it pulled a cable. Just yanked on the string. Yeah. Uh, and so that's how that developed. And of course, five minutes into that process, they were like, whoa, if I hit this note and hit the pedal, then it goes, and you can do all these crazy bends. But the cool thing is like you can play like a G triad, so like a G, B, and a D note, and just change the B note up to a C sharp. Meaning, Meanwhile, the G and the D stay identical. So that's the big difference. Like you can't do that on a guitar. Unless the, you have a B bender. Unless right? you have a B bender, which is a, a just a rip off of the pedal steel concept. So um, I might butcher this, but rock stars, a B bender is, is a guitar, typically a Telecaster. Yeah. Where the B string, I think, right? Yeah, that's right. Has um has like a pedal steel kind of lever built into the, the body strap. of the guitar, and it's attached to the strap. So you actually, you actually just pull the neck down, and, yeah. and this in the strap button moves the lever, yeah. and causes the the B to bend up, which yeah. is a really cool sound. Yeah, and Marty Stewart is a great, great modern player of the B bender, and the guy that invented it basically is Clarence White, who was um, in the Birds at the time. Nice and, man, good dude. You're a, a veritable historian of this stuff. <laughs> um, and so, so anyway, the pedal steel has evolved, and then it became a double necked instrument with two sets of ten strings. One was tuned to the C six, and one was tuned to E nine. And then some of the modern players stopped using the C six because it sounds old timey. Right. Basically, you can't get away from it sounding like Western swing or um, Hawaiian music. So a lot of the modern players just dropped it. And so now you see a lot of single neck 10 strings with the E9 tuning, and that's the modern tuning. There's all kinds of variations and different ways to set your steel up, but that's the basic thing is an E9. What are some of the challenges today of being a pedal steel player? Well, for me, what I find in this city is nobody actually wants the sound of a pedal steel anymore, <laughs> unless you're playing Americana or folk or singer-songwriter kind of stuff, in which case it's a great time to be a steel player. But if I ever do like a modern country thing, which sometimes I'll do like modern country demos or sessions and stuff like that, they basically don't want a pedal steel. They want to say there's a pedal steel <laughs> on it, but, the, but your role as a pedal steel player is basically to be a synth player. They want it affected to the part point and like not doing anything fancy. Um, but just, have you started a adopting cool effects? Like, do you get a pog no. pedal and things no. like that? Yeah, I just Micro I'm not really into it. So I just I like playing pedal steel. So if so, you know, like most of my work is in Americana stuff where they where they dig that. Yeah, like yeah. they want. Yeah. You know, if you sound like Lloyd Green or somebody from the. 60s, that's what they want. You know, they want that sound. So it, it's a great time for that kind of stuff. I think it's a good reminder to us, though, also rock stars, that so much of the interpret interpretation of music is like, it's that simple. It's like somebody's like, if this instrument is there, it, this song equals this. Totally, you know? yeah. And we have to remember that when we're producing and recording for people. Um, because otherwise we'll sit around trying to convince people to do stuff that, yeah. not, that they they either do or don't want in the end anyway. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's jump into some of the, our jam session questions. Um, when you were <coughs> starting out, what do you feel like was holding you back? Um, well, um, I would say as far as like being in the studio and like working. You, you, t you tell us. Yeah. Whatever, whatever was an important lesson you want to share. Well, I think what we talked about earlier, which was that my first exposure to all this stuff was such a non-organic way of doing it. And that's fine. That worked for, for that genre and that time of of music. But that was my big exposure to music. And, and that was how I thought you made records. And so that was holding me back in the sense that what I was hearing in my head and what I was attracted to musically was not what I was exposed to as a as a um, studio player, but I was just a kid. So I wasn't even a studio player. I was just a 
kid playing music. I think that but, could be very relevant today. So imagine, you know, your passion is acoustic guitar and you're trying to learn more about it. You know, you go on the internet and everybody's showing you how to make beats or something like that. It's probably, yeah, yeah. I think we're just surrounded with so many, like every other style of creative art, art and music is this close to us now because mm -hmm. of the internet. Yeah. So I, I feel like that held me back in a way like it also was inspiring to see people work at that high level, but, but just shedding that whole thing. And just like, I've spent my whole career basically going so far in the opposite direction that I feel like it's taken me this long to like actually really find that, you know, whereas when I started out, all I saw was, was because of the time and because of the, the things that I was exposed to, that was all I saw. So it yeah. took me a long time to kind of like realize, oh, there, th there are people like Joe Henry and Tubo Burnett that are doing the thing. If I had been exposed to that instead, when I was 17, my life would have probably been a lot different. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what, what sort of takeaway do you have as far as, um, you know, I guess, I guess the lesson was if something else had happened, it would be different. Or do you feel like there was a, a takeaway lesson for you about like, as long as you did these things, it, it turned out fine anyway. Yeah, I I, I have no re regrets or or you know I don't I don't think that that my path would would have been better in any other situation. I'm yeah, just saying. It sounds for, like you just had kind of had to just kind of stick to your guns on the stuff. You yeah, I had to trust I had to it. figure out for myself basically yeah, that yeah. there's other ways to do things. All right, so now how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? Anything that kind of anybody really influenced? Them? Was this uh, name Bruce? Was it Who Bruce was, Fairburn? Yeah, yeah so. I don't know if you got you have memories about that, but um, or any any other great advice you received, sort of getting started in this stuff. Um, well, as far as like um, uh, actual like recording advice, I think the best piece of advice that's come in practical use for me was not directly, but he, but reading an interview with John Bryan, who we talked about before. And the one thing that stuck out to me in the interview was he said, just have one good mic and just have that mic always on and just put it on any, everything. And it was sort of like that to me has come in handy so many times. So I always do that. I always now in each room that something might happen in, there's always a microphone of decent quality, ideally like, a, like even just like invest in one really nice mic and just have it on all the time. Uh, that to me, I think is even though that wasn't personal advice, that was like probably the one thing that I've, that's like just resulted in so much good stuff happening for my entire career that I've always yeah. remembered that. I think that's a, that's great advice. And it's, it's what I was kind of describing when I was taking the Roswell Delphos through this Oasis cable into, into right. just an interface with a laptop that I could be anywhere and just put that on anything. I felt like that. I was like, I just kind of want to just do a bunch of stuff with just this one thing and yeah. not, you know. And crazy shit happens all, all the time in it. sessions and people are coming up with crazy ideas and stuff. And the last thing you want to do, as you, you mentioned, is like say, okay, well, just give me 10 minutes while I set up a mic and then it's yeah. gone. And that idea happened minus 10 minutes ago. <laughs> totally. Um, how about uh, any like recording tip hack or secret sauce you want to share? Something that the rock stars could be using on their next recording today? Um. Yeah, one thing that it s seems sort of counterintuitive to the to the kind of music that I do, which is like a lot of very organic stuff and Americana and roots blues and stuff like that, I found I've frequently at the end of a song, I frequently get the drummer to play individual things, individual drums. For oh me. yeah, hit! I call them hits. A hit that to me has come in handy so often for um, any time I'm doing like some rearranging or manipulating or anything like that, that to me has been really invaluable. You know, 85 to 95% of the time I won't use that kind of a thing, but having it there has really um, saved my bacon. Like with, you know, if you, if you want to drastically alter a section of a song yeah. after the fact, um, but you can't because everything, like you can't just splice everything and it, or else it's gone. You know, like the, the drums can't just vanish right, song, exactly, or else yeah. it won't sound organic. A lot but of times suddenly you I... fly in a, you fly in a little cymbal hit that you just randomly had recorded 
and everything sounds totally normal again right, all of a sudden. Right. Um, so that and and the, and also having a small amp around. Um, you know, if I'm recording an acoustic guitar, I'll plug it into the small amp as well. So my, my go-to is this is I mentioned before as well my the Fender Blue uh, Pro Junior, tiny little amp. And, uh, you know, if somebody's playing an acoustic guitar, I'll run it through the amp as well. Yeah. Um, if I'm playing a guitar in a control room and my amp is downstairs or 20 feet away from me, it reacts in a weird way. It doesn't You're react as if I was sitting right there. Yeah. But if you malt your guitar out and put it into a, your little amp that's sitting right beside you as well, suddenly your guitar reacts as if the amp is sitting right there. So it does things, good things for that. I run vocals through it all the time. So having a little amp, a little amp that sounds cool it doesn't need to be a good amp. It can be a thirty dollar amp. Yeah. Uh, as long as it sounds cool, it, it's a, an amazing resource for just like making stuff sound different. Very cool. Um, I dig that. Um, all right. So, how about a? F well, I think I was going to ask you about a hardware tool, but I think that you just described that with the amp, you know, for sure. Um, unless there was anything else you wanted to mention, something physical you like to have around on sessions. Moving blankets. <laughs> yeah, great choice, man. Great tip. <laughs> uh, that, those to me, like I have a big stack of them when I moved from Vancouver to Nashville. Like I bought 50 of them or something. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll keep these around. Like, uh, you know, I'd use them before in sessions, but I'll use like 20 or 30 all the time. I'll put one up on a wall. We'll put one up around an upright base. We'll it, it just use them all the time. And they really are effective ways to block sound. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's as far as like low, low fi hardware gadgets, that's a good one. And they cost yeah. 90 cents. Um, a couple of things about moving blankets. If you just get some little clamps, some little spring clamps, yeah. you can kind of clip them onto things totally. easily. Yeah. And then also, um, I like to take additional mic stands and you, you extend it up and then you just make it go halfway and, and do it as a T. So it looks like a giant. Yeah. All my tea. shitty and then um, this, guitar center. Yeah. Mic stands they, that they don't, don't want to use on anything. Yeah. <laughs> They're great for just, you know, drape the blanket over. Now you have this like moving gobo thing yeah. for, for blocking stuff. Totally. And I was remembering something I wanted to share about uh, the drum hits when you were talking. So just uh, my tip to add on to that rock stars is when you're getting those hits, you need to uh, ask the drummer, to hit the instrument, the part, whatever drum or cymbal or something, and um, do it a few times for the drums. So you get some different levels or volumes. But the cymbal, make sure they wait until the cymbal's done. It sounds, it records yeah. a lot longer than the drummer might be hearing it in the headphones. Yeah. Uh, turn off the click track during that process so that you don't have click. Or bleed. even better yet, don't use a click track. Or don't use a click track. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and if you're, um, and also, Remember that your voice on the talkback telling him to hit the next thing, that's probably going to bleed in on that the sustain of that symbol. So just be cautious of all those little things. Yep, good points. Lots of space around it. Um, how about any software tools, anything kind of hip that you want to recommend or something you're excited about using? My Well, my real go-tos, that the one that I mentioned, uh, which I forgot the name of and you told me. Um, oh, the Neutron? Was it? No, that one's cool too. But oh, the, 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 the uh, transient designer. Transient designer. That's a great one for acoustic instruments. Weirdly, uh, yeah. The other one for me is Fab Filter and the uh, the Pro Q. That's the EQ, and it's very graphic, and you can see exactly what you're he hearing. It's a yeah, nice that way to great. visualize I like, it. I like using that one a lot. My favorite feature of that is so I'm a big fan of high pass filters. I use them a lot. Very, I kind of obsess over them because they really they don't affect the tone. I'm happy with the tone, but they clean up a lot of nonsense. But the coolest feature of that is the one where you you slap a high pass filter on and then I think it's a little headphone logo and you hold it and all and it makes it so that all you're hearing is what you're filtering out. Oh, that's cool. And that to me is like incredibly useful. And then you can for, just kind of hear, you can just scoot it around until you're like, yeah, yeah that's now I'm taking out sound that I like. Yeah. So I used to do that it. manually by like finding a spot on a, like a three, three point EQ and then like doing the reverse and bringing the reverse in to see what I was filtering out. But this takes care of all that with one button. It just, all you're hearing is what you're getting rid of. That's great. Great yeah. tip, man. And um, I think it's, yeah, it's a little headphone. It's a secret little, well, it's not a secret. Yeah, it's like the it's headphone like, icon is the solo. Yeah. 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 All right, cool. Let's jump to the end because we've been going for a long time. Right. 
we'll take the way back studio machine as a hypothetical question. You're going to go back in time, find <laughs> young Steve, uh, maybe getting ready to go to Berkeley or maybe coming out of Berkeley. And um, you walk up and say, hey, young Steve, I've come to give you this one <laughs> bit of advice. And you're like, get out of here, old Steve. I'm not ready for you. Uh, no, you say, I've come to tell you uh, this is the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Um, I guess just embrace the mistakes that happen because, you know, as as they're going down, something that feels drastically wrong and out of time and like the wrong thing to play at the wrong time ends up being the most memorable thing on the whole song, maybe. I mean, not necessarily, but quite often things like that happen. So I would say, you know, as as a youngster who's like, I was like obsessed with like trying to make things as perfect as possible. Yeah. And I think I've come to the realization that, that that's boring <laughs> and that some of the crazy, weird, unpredictable stuff is where all that magic is. Nice. Well, dude, thank you so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars Thanks. with us. It's a pleasure, man. pleasure to hang out with you and talk about all this stuff. You're a natural with a podcast of your own. Remind the rock stars how they can go uh, listen to your podcast and, and learn more about making records. It's called uh, Music Makers and Soul Shakers. And it's uh, kind of like this, like yapping with mostly with musicians uh, about particular records that they've made and some of the secrets and the gear that they used and stuff like that. Um and you can get it on iTunes and wherever else. Um, I, I don't think I'm as dialed in with getting it out to all the sources, but it's definitely on iTunes. It's also at my website, stevedawson.ca. There's a podcast page and all the episodes are there for streaming through SoundCloud. And yeah, check it out. Awesome. And Rockstar, as a reminder, we'll have links to the stuff we're talking about in the show notes, YouTube player, and just go uh, listen to some of these records we're discussing and go check out Steve's awesome recordings. Great stuff, especially... Um, the uh, the um, ba Birds of Chicago, really beautiful sounding um, cool, acoustic records too. Yeah. So again, thank you for being here. Look forward to coming and seeing your studio here in Nashville and yeah. just uh, hanging out again. Right on. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks, Lidge. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.